good afternoon to everyone. Uh, welcome to this session, Reference Coordinate Systems. My name is Kamil Teke. Uh, I and Professor Tefik Özdemir will help uh, the speakers in the management of this part of the session. You would write your questions during the presentation to me or other uh, convener, Professor Tefik Özdemir, if you have any. Now, I am pleased to introduce our first invited speaker, Professor Robert Ankemra. Uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to him on behalf of all participants for accepting our invitation to give an oral presentation on geodetic aspects of International Celestial Reference Frame 3, ICRF 3. Professor Robert Henkelman is the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service Analysis Coordinator, IRS Analysis Coordinator. He is responsible for the long-term and internal consistency of the IRS reference frames and the other IRS combined products. Professor Henkelmann is also the head of the VLBI group at Geoforschung Centrum Postam, Germany. His featured areas of, of expertise, among others, are the analysis of VLBI observations, earth rotation, celestial reference frames, and the parameter combination of the space geotic techniques. Okay, Professor Henkelmann, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, you can start the meeting. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, Professor Teke, dear Kamil, dear participants. It's nice to be in front of Turkish National Geodetic Commission. I'm glad to be here and uh, I will give a presentation today about the International Celestial Reference Frame uh, 3 and I try to uh, cover most of all the geodetic aspects, but I will a little bit also cover astronomical and astrometrical aspects. So I would like to start with this uh, full slide here, which gives an uh, overview of the various uh, kinds of celestial reference frames and systems. So basically, I am discerning left-hand side, which are uh, barycentered reference systems, from the right-hand side, which are geocentric reference systems. And uh, here on the, in the middle, we see the current conventional celestial reference system. This means uh, that this is the reference systems where all other celestial reference uh, systems refer to. The conventional system is a, a realization in radio wavelengths and the objects inside this system are uh, extragalactic. Uh, for those of you who know about optical astronomy, we had in the past uh, this area here, the so-called fundamental catalog 5, FK5 system, which was uh, defined on the J2000.0. Uh, this is a, a realization in optical wavelengths, and uh, this was used uh, to um, establish a reference direction of right ascension of a certain object, uh, which uh, was taken over for the first uh, definition of the current CCRS. So other celestial reference systems that are well known are the system of ephemerides of planets and the moon. And this system shown here in this diagram is also referring its orientation with respect to the ICRS. And this is practically achieved with, through VLBI observations for the inner planets, for the rocky and metallic planets, and for the outer planets, geysers and ice planets, there are optical observations in use. So this is the <clears throat> setup that we have for barycentric celestial reference systems. Barycenter, by the way, is the center of mass of the solar system. And then we have another class of celestial systems which are centered at the center of mass of Earth. And this group of system is uh, uh, the GCRS, geocentric 
celestial reference system. And these are, uh, for example, applied uh, for the modeling of Earth satellites. So where you have orbital parameters, longitude of the ascending node, argument of periapsis inclination, just to give some examples. So these satellite orbits are referring to the GCRS. <clears throat> and the ICRF3 that we are talking about today is a realization of this reference system here. So what is a celestial reference system? It is a physical reference system that is used to describe coordinates <clears throat> of a certain kind of celestial bodies. And out of the different uh, possible uh, celestial reference systems, the conventional uh, celestial reference system is based on extragalactic objects. And all the other celestial reference systems somehow refer to this system and use it as a datum to fix external orientation. <clears throat> this um, conventional celestial reference system is unfortunately only quasi inertial. This means uh, that the inertiality of this reference system is not uh, physically constrained, it's not a physical characteristic, but it is actually only uh, approximated through uh, mathematical condition equations. Uh, these condition equations are called no net rotation or NNR conditions. So the uh, ICRS is kinematically non-rotating. Because of this, we see the following effect. Um, as we realize reference axis uh, based on uh, different subsets of datum points, we can see the reference axis direction change a little bit at the level, a very small level of 10 or maybe 20 micro arc seconds. So this is well below the millimeter if we, uh, if we define this angle opening on the Earth's surface. So the technology to realize the conventional celestial reference system is very long baseline, interferometry, short VLBI. And uh, this is a long-standing technology. It has already been started in the, in the 60s of the last century. So it is currently it's, uh, at full operational technology readiness level. And um, uh, because of this technology VLBI, the conventional celestial reference system is at any time maintainable um, as long as VLBI observations are carried out. So in contrast, um, I would like to uh, show you here in one slide another group of uh, inertial reference systems that can be used to monitor, for example, Earth orientation. And these are local inertial reference systems. I am uh, in particular talking about ring laser gyroscopes or quantum gyroscopes and comparable sensors. And these sensors have uh, theoretically a big advantage because they realize dynamically non-rotating reference systems. So we do not have the quasi-inertiality here, but the true inertiality. And these sensors are very interesting for geophysics, for example. They are very suitable to show short-term variations of Earth rotation. But for the reference frames, which is typically more a long-term um, job, these uh, sensors ha uh, have problems because they are affected by environmental effects from, uh, for example, temperature change or air pressure change. And these uh, effects degrade the stability in particular on mid and long term. So for this reason, these sensors do not uh, qualify very well for the establishment of reference systems. Besides this, the uh, <clears throat> celestial reference system is a truly global 
system, what does that mean? It means it can be accessed from everywhere on Earth and beyond, even from uh, within the solar system. And maybe even from outside uh, the solar system, you can access the celestial reference system in its current form. Whereas the local inertial sensors are not global, they are just local and they cannot be assessed from a different position, different from the sensor itself. The other advantage of the celestial reference system is that it is distributed. It is uh, uh, maintained by uh, the entire VLBI network. So it's not just uh, relying on a single sensor. And if the sensor fails, the reference system would be gone. So here are two examples for these ring lasers in the Bavarian forest in um, East Germany. We have the in, uh, geodetic observatory Wetzel and in Wetzel uh, ring laser is operated. And uh, another uh, ring laser, which is called Romy, is operated in the vicinity of Munich, uh, which is a three-dimensional ring laser here. You see that this is this uh, tetraeda geometry. <clears throat> but we are talking about celestial reference systems today. So before I look into the system, I would like to explain to you the coordinate system in the background of the ISRS. So the coordinate system is very simple. Uh, the uh, positions of uh, celestial objects in ICRS are all projected onto a celestial sphere. This is the spherical surface shown here in the sketch. In the sketch. So this means we are not considering distances with this reference system. We are only interested in spatial directions. So the coordinate system is a reduced spherical coordinates where the radius, the distance information is either neglected or uh, uh, projected, for example, on a unit sphere. Now the celestial coordinates used for each object are uh, shown here in the sketch. So we have right ascension here. This is this angle alpha, which is counted between zero and 24 hour angle. And we have delta, which is either above or below the uh, reference plane here. And this is the uh, angle called declination. And this is counted from the uh, celestial south pole and up to the celestial north pole. So we, uh, for each object, we just uh, specify two coordinates, right ascension and declination. And it is very simple indeed to convert these reduced spherical coordinates to uh, Cartesian coordinates. Uh, you, you just have to do uh, some trigonometry. So this is the uh, mathematical basis for the physical reference system, which is the International Celestial Reference System, ICRS. Now the origin of this reference system is the center of mass of the entire solar system, uh, abbreviated as SSB. And because of this and because of the involved dynamics of this point, the um, metric of the system is a barycentric metric and the uh, spatial dimensions included in the system are barycent are uh, com complying to barycentric coordinate time. Uh, these definitions are uh, exactly written out in the IAU uh, resolution B1.3 of the year 2000. Now, more interesting is the orientation of this system. So the principal plane as introduced in the last slide is now for this system associated with the true celestial equator. True celestial equator is the uh, uh, plane where uh, the Earth is, so to say, uh, rotating. So the, the Earth uh, equator is projected onto the celestial sphere, which delivers the celestial equator. And uh, for the reference system, this is uh, done for the reference epoch, which is J2000. So the exact models used to establish this system are 
the IAU 1976 and IAU 1980 precession nutation models. So with that, we get the principal plane where declination is defined as zero. And on this plane, we require the origin of right ascension, it's the, the zero point to start counting right ascension. And this is the equinox. Uh, the equinox is the ascending intersection of the ecliptical plane, which is shown here, and the equatorial plane. Uh, so this point is uh, given through uh, the dynamic in the solar system and the Earth's rotation. Now, this is the definition of ICRS and ICRF3. The reference frame is a realization of this system. Inside this system, we have uh, the following objects. So any point, so to say, in the ICRF is actually associated with an extragalactic radio source. An extragalactic radio source is um, shown here in this figure. We have the innermost part of a galaxy. We are here at uh, uh, spatial scales of a tenth of a light year. So this is the absolute innermost center of a galaxy. Uh, typically, galaxies have 100,000 light years uh, radius, uh, sorry, uh, diameter. So this is just the center of a, a active galaxy. And inside the center of active galaxies, we have supermassive black holes uh, because of a very uh, strong physical motions and dynamics in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole. We see uh, jet formations in both uh, directions, orthogonal to the a toral plane inside the galaxy. And within these jet regions, uh, we have a magnetic field, helical magnetic field that accelerate uh, charged particles such as electrons and positrons. And after a while of acceleration, these charged particles um, cannot uh, accept the acceleration in terms of kinetic energy anymore. So at this moment, they start to emit a non-thermal radiation typically associated with synchrotron process. And this uh, moment and this place is called the shock region. So the points that we actually observe and have as objects in ICRF are the shock regions of jets of uh, uh, galactic uh, cores within radio loud active galaxies. Now, this uh, is, of course, uh, causing some problems. Uh, Extra galactic radio sources are uh, not uh, points. We cannot uh, treat them as points without errors. So uh, some of them have extensive structure. And uh, uh, furthermore, this structure can vary with time. Uh, on top of this, the uh, shock region that we see here that we are observing as the point is uh, the also depending on the observing frequency. So typically we observe uh, higher frequencies closer to the center of the galaxy and lower frequencies are stratified away from the galaxy. So we have both time and frequency varying positions in of objects in ICRF. <clears throat> so how is the structure relating to the astrometry? I have here an, a small movie embedded in my presentation, which shows the structure variation of a famous radio source over 17 years. Uh, the, the main component of the radio source is here in this yellowish color. Uh, and you can see that there is a side component in the jet direction, which is over time uh, taking more or less uh, uh, emission or flux. And uh, I'm comparing the coordinates of this object here. We have right ascension and here we have declination over time. And you can see, for example, that the right ascension has a small drift here and here a small jump and then again a small drift. And this um, pseudo motion is not a motion of the galaxy as such, but is a, is a change of the uh, structure of the object where this um, additional um, peak here moves a bit away and becomes less and more um, effective. So this is something that you can also see in flux 
time series at the at the jump point here, which is roughly in the year 2005, we can see a minimum in flux, which is then again increasing. Uh, I, I'm now going over to a history of radio reference frames. So uh, in the 70s, there were already a very large number of radio source catalogs, more than 30,000 objects. Uh, following this uh, first work, uh, there was the first IERS extragalactic reference frame defined in 1991, and it was compared to Hipparchus. And in the following, the uh, IAU, the International Astronomical Union, adopted the uh, uh, extragalactic um, radio frame uh, as the new conventional radio frame. So this happened here in the change over to 1998. So starting with that, we had the first ICRF, which was then extended a couple of years later until it had about a number of 700 objects. Now we continue in the year 2010, there was the second release, which had already dramatically more objects at the level of 3,500 and latest release, the ICRF3, was accepted in 2019. It has now five and a half thousand objects. So how are these uh, reference frames accepted by the community? Well, this is done in the following way for ICF3. The product was obtained in a working group of International Astronomical Union and the relevant scientific bodies, uh, it, IAU and also IAG, accept this product as a conventional frame by resolutions. So there was an IAU, resolution accepted and an IAG resolution accepted. So it's a democratic process, we can say. The, the astronomers and the geodesists vote and in favor or against these products. Within the ICRF3, we have three different data sets. So first of all, we have uh, a lot of observations in classical NASA frequencies. This is S and X band. Frequencies are shown here at the level of more than 13 million observations. But on top of the SX, we also have a part of the catalog in K band. And we have another fraction of the catalog in KA and X band, which are less observations, as you can see. K band is just half a million, and the KAX is just 70,000 observations. And the, these products started in the later years, whereas the uh, classical VLBI starts already at the end of the 70s here, considered for ICF3. How are the defining sources selected for ICF3? Well, this time the approach was in the following. Celestial sphere was divided into equal areas, exactly 324 parcels. And uh, on top of this, uh, for each parcel, an astrometric uh, quality check was done for all the sources in a certain grid, so to say. And then the sources were uh, listed according to their uh, structure, so the least structure, the best. And finally, for each sector or grid element, uh, one very good uh, radio source was selected as a defining source. And this is possible for about 72% of the sectors. For other sectors, 20%, uh, there were only objects uh, or structure quality B available. And for other uh, grids, uh, we had to take uh, class C or uh, find other solutions. So only two sectors have uh, no radio source, and uh, this is well below one. Percentage. So we can see from the distribution of defining sources, the reference directions in space are very well definable. So how is the ICF3 solution configured uh, in the uh, software? The models strictly adhere to the IERS conventions. Uh, for the K-band, ionospheric corrections were done using global ionospheric maps from IGS. And then all sources were parameters as global parameters. 
So this means we have also uh, homogeneous uh, formal errors for all the sources. And at the moment, the ICRF3 uh, SX establishes the reference directions and the other uh, catalogs in other wavelengths are uh, aligned to the SX catalog. So checking the, my speaking time, I have to speed up a little bit. So I will drop some of the details and go uh, to a comparison of the catalog with the last catalog, which was ICRF2. And I'm just showing you systematic differences between these two catalogs. You can see here rotation and deformation parameters and the largest deformation are here at the level of 80 micro arc seconds for the deformation in third uh, axial direction. So the, some small deformations were found with respect to the predecessor. The catalogs at the other radio bands, also newly established, uh, are already very good and the sources are very well distributed. Errors are very nice. And uh, one thing I would like to mention about the ICF3 is shown here on this slide. So for ICF3, for the first time, the rotation of the galaxy is considered. So as the center of the reference uh, system is here at uh, solar system, barycenter, but the galaxy is rotating and with respect to external galaxies, we have an aberration here. The aberration is not very large, uh, calculated in terms of uh, variations of coordinates. This is an effect at the level of six micro arc second per year. Um, but uh, this is something that is now considered uh, in the analysis. And this makes the ICRF3 uh, catalog that depends on time. That is different from the other uh, reference frames before. So the reference epoch is 2015 and maximal velocities uh, with respect to this reference epoch are at this level. Now, this is the view of our optical um, universe as seen from Gaia. I would like to do a very short comparison uh, of the ICRF with Gaia here. Gaia is an ESA mission started uh, in December 2013 originally designed for five years. The um, mission is to observe more than a billion stars. And according to the visual magnitude, we can uh, get, uh, as promised, very good uh, quality. Now, the interesting factor for us about Gaia is that Gaia will also observe very high number of radio sources, actually the optical counterpart of the radio sources. And this can be used to align this reference frame to ICRF. Uh, in this uh, movie, you see how Gaia scans the uh, universe um, by rotating and processing around its axis. Now, uh, this is a first uh, chart showing the uh, coordinates from the uh, Gaia mission. And we can see here uh, uh, also nice distribution of points apart from the sections which are covered by the uh, galactic disk and where the optical density is very high. So it's not possible to see radio sources in the back. Okay, so here are some statistics about the comparison of the ICRF3 with Gaia. We can see here no deformations uh, up to a level of roughly 30 micro arc second, which is about a millimeter. So I come to an end with a very short summary. ICRF3 uh, has advantages over its predecessor, ICRF2. We have uh, more uh, radio sources included. We have much better inclusion of multiband uh, positions. We see deformations with respect to the predecessor and the, the predecessing system is to be blamed. We see no deformation with respect to current Gaia data sets. And uh, for the ICF3, galactic aberration is now corrected. And um, the, the good news is that we go towards multi-wavelength realization 
of radio reference frames. So for a level of 600 objects, we now already have uh, uh, triple frequency positions. Okay, I have a small outlook here and some thread, but my time is over. I think I have to stop right here. Thank you for attention. Uh, Professor Henk uh, thank you for uh, this uh, very impressive and informative presentation. Uh, let's uh, move to the uh, questions. Do the attendees have any questions to Professor Henk Oh, if not uh, just now, uh, I do have uh, a few, uh, if you uh, Of course. Professor, professor. Uh, my first question would be, <clears throat> okay, Gaia is an optical uh, astro ast astrometry uh, or technique, astronomy technique, uh, and we are uh, using uh, radio wavelengths. Uh, would it be possible to combine these two techniques with each other? For the next realization of ICRF, what would you envisage about this issue? So I think it's an interesting question. In principle, yes, you could combine, but you, we have to discuss whether this makes sense on a physical point of view. And the physical dimension is um, whether the optical um, center of emission coincides with the radio wavelength center of emission. And this is obviously not the case. So in Gaia, you see optical counterpart of the galaxy. Whereas in the radio uh, wavelengths, you see, as I described in one of my slides, you see this shock region inside the jet, which is not necessarily optically active. For this reason, if you compare positions from Gaia and from uh, ICRF, you can see uh, significant angular differences. Um, if you have models uh, for each object, that describe these differences, like, a, a, let's say, a, a tie vector expressed in right ascension and declination. And uh, you can also exclude the temporal variations of this or model it appropriately. In this case, you could apply an, a tie and then you could actually combine these uh, two positions. So technically it's possible. Physically, you have to use some sort of ties for that. Uh, I have one more. Uh, the, the, the, there is an issue uh, related to uh, Divos. Uh, I mean, the new concept of BLBI, a broadband uh, uh, radio wavelength will be used. Then the source structure effect will be much more important uh, than previous analysis. Uh, is there a model that is uh, developed for? To, for uh, for uh, uh, for uh, eliminating the effect of source structures when uh, analyzing uh, when realization when realizing the ICR three. Yeah, because it's the in in in indeed the upcoming new uh, VLBI observing system and it's it is already running. It's not fully established but running. And uh, Vigos observes in different frequencies, uh, frequencies different from SX, also different from the other catalogs. So we can expect that we get uh, different celestial reference frames from Vigos. And in future, it will be the job uh, to um, make these reference frames consistent with each other. Now, um, the important for a reference frame and the continuity of the reference frame is to make this uh, uh, change over from the standard VLBI to Vigos um, stable so that you can maintain all the, the good features, the advantages of this reference frame. And this is not a simple task um, because uh, we also don't have very good uh, terrestrial coordinates at the moment for the Vigos antennas. I hope that uh, my dear colleague, Professor Zuhair Alter Mimi, can uh, say something about this. So we expect an update for these catalog um, uh, coordinates for the antennas, and then we can work on the celestial uh, catalogs better. Now coming to the structure. The structure is an, is an issue actually for all the different frequencies. For Vigos, it's a bit more pronounced because Vigos observes not very, um, very narrow channels. 
a couple of distribution of narrow channels, but is actually believed to observe very broad windows of frequencies. So currently about 500 uh, megahertz, but in future they could, these channels could be one, uh, uh, one gigahertz wide. And, uh, and then within this gigahertz, you would get uh, more structure problems because the, the structure is something that changes with the frequency. We already discussed this. At the same time, uh, you also have to treat the ionospheric effects or generally speaking dispersive effects uh, more sophisticated because you see already within the band, you already see uh, curvature uh, of the phases due to the uh, dispersion. <clears throat> and uh, so the because is a bit more complicated and uh, for this reason, it's, it's taking a bit time to get established. Uh, actually, I do have several uh, questions, but uh, I could not uh, uh, ask it, ask them because we are very uh, strict, uh, strict timeline. Uh, Sorry. I, I, I am again uh, thankful to you uh, on behalf of the uh, participants. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, by the way, do you have any questions or uh, any comments, uh, Professor uh, Zudemir? Thank, thank you, Robert, for, for, for this valuable contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now, uh, let's move to next presentation. Uh, I will uh, give a brief information about uh, Professor Zuhair Altamimi. Uh, okay. Professor Zuhair Altamimi is going to give a talk about ITRF 2020. On behalf of all participants, I cordially would like to thank him very much for accepting our invitation to give an oral presentation on ITRF 2020. Since more than three decades, Zuhair, Professor Zuhair Atamimi is the lead of the research activities related to the development, maintenance, improvement, and realization of the International Terrestrial Reference Frames, ITRF. He is the leader of the IERS ITRS Center, and working at the National Institute of Geographic and Forest Information, IGN, France, his principal research areas are space geodesy, theory and realization of terrestrial reference systems. Professor Altamimi has been a leader in adopting rigorous mathematical methods to combine diverse multi-center multi-technic geodetic solutions. Now, Professor Altamimi, please, you will start your presentation. The ground is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Camille, and thank you for inviting me to participate to your uh, uh, Geodetic Commission annual scientific meeting. It's a pleasure for me. So, marhaba, everyone. Thank you. Okay, I will try now to share my screen, and I hope it will work as uh, it should work. Okay, is that enough? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's sure. Okay, uh, so uh, as you said, uh, my presentation will be about the ITRF 2020. We are still working on that. And the focus of the presentation will be about uh, how we enhance the modeling of nonlinear station motions. And I want to uh, acknowledge the contribution of my uh, co-authors who are in, on the screen as you see here. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I will, uh, uh, first of all, start by something uh, related to the reference frame uh, concept and why do we need a reference frame. Uh, then I will uh, also show you how we construct the ITRF and in particular the ITRF 2020 and the combination model in terms of strategy. And then the network and collocations. The ITRF 2020, as you will see, will be an augmented uh, parametric reference frame, and I will explain how it works, especially because we will provide to the users periodic signals and post-seismic deformation models. I will touch uh, a little bit on the scale of the ITRF 2020, and you will understand why I am talking about the scale of ITRF 2020. And I will show you some uh, preliminary results, and we are at the uh, point to uh, actually deliver uh, a preliminary solution called ITRF 2020P preliminary solution. And we will submit that to the uh, IAG services to evaluate that solution. And the final solution will hopefully be available uh, beginning next year. Now, just to uh, 
Okay, sorry. Just to uh, try to uh, recall, why do we need a reference system and a reference frame? And in here, in this uh, uh, schema, you you you can see all the scientific applications that need a terrestrial reference frame. And in the bottom, see uh, you see the magic numbers that we need the IHRF in terms of its parameters. I mean the origin, the scale, the orientation to be accurate at the level of one millimeter and stable at 0 0.1 millimeter per year. So these are the scientific applications. You can read on the slide all what uh, these uh, applications uh, are. Uh, but uh, one point is that it is important also is the operational geodesy application. Uh, uh, the reference frame, the global reference frame, such as the IHRF is also important for national geodetic systems and frames, and I will be happy to learn about the Turkish realization of the, their national reference frame. It's also important for positioning applications in real time or post processing. It's also important for aviation, I mean navigation in general, aviation, terrestrial or maritime. As you know, for uh, operational geodesy application, we are using only GNSS technology. We don't use SLR, DORIS, or VLBI for that, for, for obvious reasons. And using GNSS, it requires the availability of the orbits, but also the reference frame itself, the IHRF. And we have uh, many, many users uh, who are needing the global reference frame, the IHRF, to align to and for their operational duties application. Now, one uh, critical uh, an indicator of climate change and uh, global warming is the mean sea level ch uh, change. I, I borrow this, uh, this uh, slide from uh, on the internet, but uh, you have the reference here for, for, for this uh, uh, mean sea level uh, uh, trend. As you see, it is about 3.4 millimeter per year. Uh, why I am showing that? I am showing that because the IHRF is important for such application because for all altimetry satellite, they use the IHRF actually to calibrate their altimetry measurement and the orbit in particular to the IHRF. So if the IHRF has a small, a very tiny drift, say one millimeter per year, one millimeter per year is very small number, but this will translate in an apparent uh, 0 0.9 millimeter per year in sea level rise at high, high light latitudes. So you can see the importance of the reference frame for such application. Now, uh, the earth is deforming, we know that, uh, but how, and we have also techni uh, technique systematic errors. How to deal with that, the, the deformable earth and the technique systematic errors when it comes to realize a reference frame? We have two types of, uh, uh, of motion. We have uh, nearly uh, linear motion, and these are mainly te uh, tectonic motion, mainly horizontal, by providing uh, a plate motion model. But also we have that phenomena of post-glacial rebound, which induce also vertical and horizontal motion. And we have an, a variety of uh, non-linear motion, loading deformation, for instance, co- and post-seismic deformation, porothermal elastic deformations. We have also transient volcano eruptions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and uh, we have also to deal with the systematic errors for the techniques. Unfortunately, our techniques are not perfect for uh, various reasons. We have uh, systematic errors such as uh, draconetics, which we see in satellite techniques, uh, and in particular GPS. We have monument instability, the thermal deformation, and the gravitational deformation. Now, how we can represent a reference frame, taking into account that uh, uh, uh, the, the, the, the, I mean the, the, the fact that the Earth is deforming. We have actually two modes of representations for the reference frame. The first one is what we call the long-term linear frame where you have mean, mean station positions at a reference epoch and station velocities. This is the indispensable ba basis for science and operational geodesy application. And that's what we call the regularized positions, which means with piecewise linear function. 
And I, if I say piecewise linear function, as you will see, we will see that we have discontinuities in the time series provided by the four space geodetic techniques that we need to deal with. The second category of reference frame representations, that's what I call non-linear reference frame. And here you have two types. The first one is an augmented parametric reference frame. It means that you take the secular frame, the first one, the linear one, and add non-linear parametric functions. And that will that is the case of ITRF 2020. So in addition to the station positions and velocities, you will have parametric functions for the post-seismic post deformation, but also for the seasonal signals. I will come back to that later. Now, the second type of non-linear reference frame is what we call non-parametric reference frame, which means that we can establish a time series of quasi-instantaneous reference frame, which with, for instance, daily or weekly representations. And all the non-linear motion will be embedded in the time series of such realization. But that type, this type of reference frame will still rely on the IHR for at least the orientation definition. And all the above, all type of uh, reference frame representation will be uh, uh, dependent on technique systematic errors, not dependent or actually suffer from, from technique systematic errors. And the big question, is how to separate the technique systematic errors from the physical or geophysical phenomena that uh, change the shape of the Earth system. Now, the IHRF 2020 construction, here in the left you have the input. Uh, we have time series, Doris uh, and SLR are given uh, at a weekly basis. And we have the GNSS IGS contribution, which is at the daily uh, contribution. And from VLBI, uh, it's session-wise uh, contribution. Uh, we need, of course, local ties at co-location sites in order to connect the four techniques together. And in addition to that, we have to add additional constraints at co-location site to equate velocities and to equate seasonal signals. Because in the ITRF 2020, uh, we will stack these time series all together it not only, I think there is a typo here, all, uh, there is a double L, all together, sorry for that typo. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, uh, compared to past IHRF solutions, we stack the time series for individual techniques in, uh, separately, and then we combine the long-term solutions. Here, we will stack all the techniques and time series all together, and we will model the periodic signals and post seismic deformation for stations that are subject to major earthquakes. And uh, in this step, of course, we need to specify the uh, reference frame parameters. And as usual, we will take SLR frame to define the origin and SLR plus VLBI to define the scale. And we will align ITRF 2020 to ITRF 2014 in order to preserve the orientation, especially for earth rotation parameters. Now, the ITRF 2020 will have uh, position velocities, uh, uh, parametric functions for post seismic deformation, seasonal signals, and EUPs. Now, these are uh, the equations, but I am not going to go into the details of these equations. The first step, uh, set of equations is dealing with station positions, velocity transformation parameters, and periodic signals. And uh, here, uh, this set of equations are uh, related to the Earth orientation parameters, and the link between these and the frame itself will be operated through uh, the three rotations, R1, R2, and R3, around the three axes. And here, it is a general uh, model uh, or uh, for, for the post-seismic deformation using logarithmic exponential, uh, the combination of two, or uh, uh, et cetera. We have five different uh, uh, combination of these uh, functions, uh, logarithmic or exponential, to define uh, the, the post-seismic deformation uh, models. Now, this is the map that shows you the ITRF 2020 site, the expected site, and you can see that there is a inhomogeneity in terms of distribution between North and South. 
uh, we have 1,200, uh, we will have more one, uh, um, 1,200 sites uh, with 180, uh, 1,800 stations, and we will have more than 3,000 discontinuities. And this is really a big issue, especially for uh, GNSS sites where we have about 3,000 discontinuities. Just to give you an example, for Ankara, in your country, we have this station with about 10 discontinuities. One, only one of these discontinuity, discontinuities is, really, is related to earthquake. The others are due to antenna change and also some strange behavior of that station where we have some kind of non-linearity at some time of that uh, stage. Now, uh, the ITRF 2020 will be an augmented parametric reference frame, as I said before, because we will provide to the users that quantity, which we call the post-seismic deformation. We will provide the models so that the users can uh, calculate that uh, delta X PSD in order to get their instantaneous position, uh, let's say, at the uh, uh, uh, the trajectory of that station, which is not linear after, after the earthquake. We will also provide the seasonal signals, which are provided expressed in the center of mass of SLR frame. We see discrepancies at some collocation site between, uh, between techniques at the annual signal. Uh, now, this is a periodogram uh, of the IGS Repro3 contribution to ITRF 2020. It is a, uh, actually the uh, cumulative residual, uh, residuals of all stations, where we estimated 10 frequencies, the annual, semi-annual, and eight GPS draconetics. And this is a very uh, a huge computation because it takes about two weeks to finish. Uh, because we have about 300 stations, uh, if we count all the discontinuities in the sta this station time series. So you have uh, the annual, semi-annual, and eight draconetics, and you have three colors. The green is for the up component, the orange for the north component, and the magenta for the east component. And you see that uh, we have uh, uh, two, uh, well, the, the, the, the dark color is when you remove uh, the periodic terms. Otherwise, you will have peaks like these, uh, in the three components. So we can see that we reduce dramatically uh, not only the annual and semi-annual, but also the draconetics. And this will help actually improving the estimate of the annual semi-annual signals uh, because we want them to uh, we want to provide them to the users uh, and express them in the center of mass of the SLR uh, frame. Uh, now, I said that we will have, uh, there are sites where we, uh, where we have uh, uh, discrepancies. This site is Nielsund in Svalbard, uh, uh, and, and I am showing the annual frequency residuals, which means that after fitting for the, uh, the annual and semi-annual for all the techniques, you can take the time series of the residuals and you fit an amplitude and phase to see how they do agree together. Here, the GNSS is in red, and uh, in green, you have the VLBI uh, estimate. And you see that in the up component, we have uh, actually a discrepancy up to one millimeter uh, in the amplitude, and it's out of phase compared to G uh, GNSS, for instance. So how to deal with this? We will reduce the sigma that impose the equality of these seasonal signals. We go from zero one a millimeter to one millimeter, and that at the end you will have two values: one for VLBI, one for GNSS, and that is what we uh, all what we can do in order to separate uh, both signals. Otherwise, if we force them to have the same signal, then we will alter the internal consistency of the reference frame. Now, just uh, some examples of uh, uh, stations with major earthquakes for which we will provide the post seismic deformation model. This is Arequipa in Peru, where we had in 2001 a big earthquake. And as you see, this is a huge the trajectory, not linear at all. 
and uh, uh, what you see here in blue is the original time series in red uh, the parametric model and in green the virtual the virtual uh, linear uh, velocities and this is the for Tsukuba in Japan where after 2010 uh, the major earthquake there we have uh, of course non-linear behavior uh, now uh, that uh, the first one was with the seasonal signals and here when we remove the seasonal signals now i am showing here for Tsukuba the gnss station and the vlbi one uh, i uh, did not mention but there is an important point to keep in mind that we actually fit or uh, model the parametric models using gnss data because we have a more dense uh, time series uh, and more precise uh, uh, time series uh, from GNSS. And then we uh, uh, at collocation site uh, where we, we have major earthquakes like this one, uh, the nearby station, the VLBI one, we actually use the GNSS fitted models for these PSD models to the VLBI data. And, and you can see that the model that we estimated using GNSS data matches very nicely the VLBI time series. And we check that for all uh, co-location sites where we, uh, we have major earthquakes. Uh, now, in Turkey, I already discussed uh, Ankara, and I mentioned that we have uh, uh, an, a huge number of discontinuities. Here we have Tubi and Istanbul. And as you see here, we have a very clear non-linear trajectory of these two stations. And both of them, which are not far from each other, about, if I am not wrong, about 50 kilometers or less than 100 kilometers. And they are impacted, both of them, by the earthquake that, two earthquakes in 1999. And Istanbul was established right uh, a few days or a hundred of days after the earthquake, uh, the earthquake. But the time series we have for Istanbul is still showing the relaxation behavior due to that earthquake, uh, independent from the beginning of its observation. But that that is something that you need to take into account if you use these uh, two stations in your application in Turkey. Uh, this is just a, an illustration of the uh, ITRF 2020P velocity fields. We will have a density of points in Australia, New Zealand, South America, and this is good in order to have a kind of uh, plate motion model uh, after after the release, uh, the release of ITRF 2020, but also in North America. And this is the vertical velocity field, and we see very clearly uh, the impact, I mean, the, the yeah, of uh, post-glacial rebound, but not only that, it's also reflecting the current ice melting in Greenland, for instance. So, about the scale of ITRF 2020, this is the first time of the ITRF history where we have four independent and competitive scale coming from the four techniques, Doris, SLR, VLBI, and also GNSS. But you have to keep in mind that uh, for IGA GNSS scale, it's based on what we call the PCOs, the face center offset of the Galileo satellites. Uh, the PCOs are the, the, the, these quantities or these, uh, the distance between the antenna on the satellite and the center of mass of that satellite. So uh, Galileo project, they actually published these PCOs. And if you fix these values, you will get uh, the scale of your reference frame. Otherwise, you have 100% uh, correlation between these PCOs and the scale of the frame. So using only 3.7 years of data of Galileo data. So the IGS adopted actually the PCOs of Galileo, fixed them, and they actually estimated the PCOs for GPS and GLONASS uh, because in the IGS contribution, we have Galileo, GLONASS, and GPS. So 3.7 uh, years of data, for me, it is too short to really uh, have a precise estimation of the 
uh, scale of GNSS. The other point is that the ILRS, in the scale, uh, they improved actually the scale determination because they enhanced and improved their handling of the range biases. And the range biases, they, they have their impact, a strong impact on the scale determination. So, uh, with respect to the ITRF uh, 2014, uh, for instance, just to recall the result uh, six years, of, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, ago, uh, when we established the ITRF 2014, here you have two panels. In the left side, you have the time series of the uh, of uh, VLBI in red, SLR in blue, and Doris in light uh, blue. Uh, actually, to define the scale of ITRF uh, 2014, at that time, we selected a subset of VLBI sessions, and we considered only the time series for SLR from 1993 up to the end of the time series. So, here we have a discrepancy. It is not visible probably very clearly, but there was a 1.4 PPP discrepancy between SLR and VLBI, which is about 8 millimeter at the equator. Now, what is, what is the situation today? Here I am showing the ILRS SLR origin component, TX, TY, TZ, but also the scale from their submission to IHRF uh, 2020. But these uh, time series of the origin component and the scale are with respect still uh, to IHRF 2014. So for this, the scale in particular, you see that the time series we used in IHRF 2014 is below the new series or, uh, by about 1 PPB even. Uh, it, uh, if it, uh, it is more than 1 PPB, it's about 1.1 PPB. So, we, we see that offset improving the scale determination by LSLR and bringing it closer to VLBI scale. And that's what I am showing here for the uh, ITRF 2020 uh, preliminary solution. Uh, what I am showing here, you have uh, four colors in uh, uh, yellow or orange, the full time series of VLBI in uh, light blue, the full time series of SLR, but we will select, as we did for the ITR 2014, specific sessions from the LBI, and uh, 1993 up, uh, no, actually here we have a discontinuity in the SLR scale at 1997.5 or 0.7, I don't remember exactly, but we will define the ITR 2000P scale by the red, uh, sessions of the LBI and the SLR dark blue uh, time series, as you see here. Why we did not this, uh, use this portion from the LBI? Uh, you can distinguish very clearly there is a kind of offset or a drift after uh, 2014, uh, which is not explained by me uh, or by my group. We don't know uh, what makes this behavior to happen in the VLBI uh, scale. We are discussing that with the IVS actors and the IVS uh, colleagues in order to un understand why we have uh, this uh, drift in the VLBI scale. So we will not use that portion. We will use all the red point here and the blue point for SLR. So the agreement, and that is the bottom line of this choice, the agreement between SLR and VLBI is now at the level of zero point PPB which means 1.4 millimeter instead of having about 8 millimeter at the time of the ITR 2014. Uh, now here in green, you have the uh, ITS Repro 3 uh, time series of the scale, and here you have Torres, and here you have the numbers for IGS, IVS, ILRS, and IDS. So again, the agreement is fantastic between VLBI and SLR, but we will still have about 0 0.6 PPB for IGS, uh, the green time series here, and for Doris about 1.3 uh, PPB, with a, a kind of significant drift for both of them, for uh, IGS and IDS, but we have about zero drift between the LBI and the SLR. And this is a tremendous, a huge improvement compared to ITRF 2014. 
Now, I don't want to take too much time, uh, just to, uh, I am coming to the conclusion, the ITF 2020 will be an augmented parametric reference frame. Uh, as I said, the scale, the expected scale, and the, uh, we will see when we deliver the final ITF 2020 solution beginning next year, but uh, we are very close to have a very uh, good agreement at the level of 1.4 millimeter compared to 8 millimeter in ITR 2014. So the ITR 2020 scale will be determined using inner internal constraint, using this period of time for SLR and selected sessions up to 2014.04 for VLBI. And the preliminary solution, as I said in the beginning of this presentation, will be ready very soon and will be submitted to the techniques for uh, evaluation. I wanted to save time, but uh, uh, I am happy to ask, uh, answer questions if there are uh, questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, for this informative and very interesting presentation. Yes, as you said, uh, do the attendees have any questions? There's a question by Ali Sankut. Uh, I may read it. Thank you very much for the presentation. He says, in ITRF 14, you provided PSD models for stations that were exposed to major earthquakes. In ITRF 2020, do you think these parameters will change for the earthquake sites already given in for, for ITRF 2014? For some sites, they will not change too much, like for Arequipa, for instance. But these will be improved parametric functions just because we will have more than five years of more data. So you can imagine that you will improve the fit, you will improve these parametric models. But there will be some changes there uh, between ITR 2014 and ITR 2020 for these stations. Yeah. Uh, there is a second question from him. Uh, how long time series uh, do you need to estimate the uh, post seismic deformation parameters? Oh, the time series, you need at least, uh, in my opinion, you need at least three years. It's uh, the same way as uh, for a normal station where uh, you don't have any earthquake or, or etc. You need at least three years of continuous observation to have, uh, to be able to estimate realable velocities. So for uh, the PSD parametric models, you need about three years of data. There is another uh, question uh, from Mehmed Emin Ayhan. Non-periodic non uh, seasonal components and uh, undocumented change points in time series are studied or not? Yeah, we will, uh, as I said, you, we will uh, provide the annual and semi-annual signals for all the stations. And these uh, amplitude and phase, we will provide that expressed in the center of mass of SLR, just because there are users who are using the IHRF to compute the orbit of satellites, and the orbit should be related to the center of mass of the Earth. So we will also provide the list of discontinuities. Uh, we will provide all the information that is necessary for, for, for the users. Uh, actually, Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what are the latest developments in incorpor incorporating the space type constraints? I mean, in normal equ equation, new, these four techniques are combined. And then uh, these uh, constraints, I mean, these uh, relative constraints uh, between, uh, I mean, local ties are used uh, with yeah. this uh, station up and the reference points. But what about the uh, space type constraints? And uh, should we anticipate if it is applied uh, again in the increase of ITRF? Yeah, in up to now, up to now, we don't use these space ties in the ITRF computation itself directly. But uh, those who are analyzing the observation at the observation level, they have the opportunity, for instance, for satellite to use both GNSS and SLR and also DORIS. So there are so satellites where you have that three types of observations, uh, but these uh, observations are not used by the IMG technique services that provide data to the ITR 2000 uh, or the ITRF in general. Uh, I have one comment about the scatter plot of the scale scales. I mean, this intertechnic, uh, sorry, uh, that is the uh, technique specific 
a scale, a scatter plot that you show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for instance, for the case of VLBI, sometimes in decisions of VLBI, we have uh, not that much, uh, I mean, uh, a few stations that are participating. At this type of uh, sessions, uh, we should observe uh, low elevation angles. Uh, and in, in low elevation angles, we have the troposphere delays unreduced on the, in the object minus computer vector. And I, uh, I, would, uh, I, I would guess, but I'm not sure, I, I may be totally wrong. Uh, should it be possible that it is because of this correlation between troposphere delays and station uh, co coordinates, these troposphere delays in the parameter estimation stage would propagate to the spatial coordinates. This would somehow uh, cause a, a, a kind of error, uh, and this uh, would at the end uh, or cause a bias in the scale. I'm not sure. I totally be. I I may be totally wrong, but uh, you think that it is possible or not? Okay. To be honest with you, I am not expert in VLBI analysis. But what we do for the IHRF, we exclude all those sessions where you have a, a, a small number of stations with regional coverage. So we will use only the red uh, sessions where you have uh, more or less uh, uh, large coverage and uh, more than six stations, actually. We will exclude the others because the, the, the, the scale determination is very weak. Uh, then uh, uh, this will bring us uh, to the uh, next uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank uh, you. Thank uh, you. Uh, and uh, the next presentation uh, will be given by Professor Henkelman, uh, uh, and uh, he will uh, explain uh, and uh, uh, talk about uh, earth about earth orientation parameters. Uh, please, uh, Robert, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello again. It's still a pleasure and an honor to present here. Uh, my second presentation is on Earth orientation, and I hope very much that I can stick to the 25 minutes timing this time. I have a second chance, so to say. Yeah, Earth's orientation parameters. There is really an interesting but also important data set uh, for science as well as for society. And I would like to demonstrate this in my presentation. So I start again with an overview slide. So in my last presentation, I have introduced the uh, barycentric celestial reference system to you. And uh, just a minute ago, uh, our dear colleague Zuhar Altamimi presented the details about the geocentric terrestrial uh, system. Uh, in my presentation, I also shortly covered the geocentric celestial system. <clears throat> and uh, as we look on the geocentric reference systems, we have two kinds of geocentric celestial system. We have one system that establishes reference directions with respect to objects in space. And this is the celestial one. And then we have the terrestrial one which establishes reference directions attached to the Earth's crust. And the difference between these two systems in terms of a transformation is Earth's orientation. So in this presentation, I am only talking about Earth's orientation. Earth's orientation from a mathematical point of view and uh, some details uh, on it, how it is uh, realized. So we talk about three-dimensional spatial vectors uh, here indicated with X and, uh, and an arrow on top. Um, and these vectors, as we know, as geodesists, can refer to different reference systems. For example, such a three-vector can refer to ITRS. At the same time, the same uh, vector can refer to GCRS, of course, with slightly different coordinates. Now, uh, if you want to uh, rotate one and the same vector, referring to ITRS, GCRS, respectively, to each other, you have to apply Earth orientation. And Earth orientation is now the series of rotations that you see here 
in the middle. Uh, these dots are nothing else than simple matrix multiplication operators and in each of these uh, symbols here we have a uh, rotation matrix in, involved. A rotation matrix as you know is an orthogonal three cross three matrix and these rotational matrices on top depend on time. So W, R and Q this is actually what Earth's orientation is doing mathematically. And uh, each of this rotation matrix transforms the, uh, the reference system uh, stepwise, so to say. The first matrix W is actually considering the polar motion part of Earth's rotation. It transforms ITRS into an intermediate terrestrial system. If you now account for the uh, Earth's rotation, which is the matrix R, you uh, uh, arrive at the celestial intermediate reference system. And if you finally apply uh, nutations and precession, which are all together in this matrix Q, you are finally in GCRS. So in principle, because we have three-dimensional vectors here, the, uh, in generally speaking, describing the difference in orientation of two three-dimensional vectors just requires three angles, minimally. That could be Eulerian or Cardanian angles. And as you can see, the procedure here uses obviously more uh, angles and more arguments. So for this reason, the, uh, the more arguments have no degree of freedom and consequently they somehow uh, correlate with each other. Now, of course, we cannot estimate uh, fully correlated parameters. For this reason, we have to decorrelate the parameters. How can we uh, do that or how is it done in the case of the Earth orientation? A frequency dependent separation scheme is applied. The frequency dependent scheme distinguishes which parts of Earth's rotation appear in this matrix and what parts of Earth's rotation appear in that matrix here. And the difference, as you can see, is uh, per definition as follows. The terrestrial, uh, so to say, wobbles, terrestrial effects are the ones that are considered with high frequency. So all the effects have here periods that are shorter or equal to two days. Whereas on the celestial side, exactly the other uh, effects are considered all the effects that are above two days. So this can be seen as low frequency effects. Now, uh, just to uh, demonstrate you a little bit um, with some sketches, I would like first to introduce the polar motion procedure. This is the matrix W. It's a time dependent uh, rotational matrix. And as you can see, we are referring the conventional uh, pole of the ITRS at its epic, which is shown here with this dashed line, to the intermediate pole at a certain date. The date is indicated with the uh, quantity T here. And we can achieve this, the difference between this direction and that direction by multiplying a rotation matrices using polar motion components in X and Y direction. Now the, the other part of the Earth's rotation is the one with respect to space. Here we can start our discussion with the Earth's body in its orbit. So we have the ecliptical plane here. This direction points to the center of mass of the solar system. And the vector that is normal to this ecliptic plane is the pole of the ecliptic. As we know, the Earth processes and also wobbles around the pole of the ecliptic with its uh, axis, with its rotation axis normal to the equator. So we have here at some position the uh, pole, conventional pole at the catalog epoch for example, ICF3 epoch. 
and this is the GCRS pole. And later or earlier, this pole is at a different position as seen in space. So this pole would be the intermediate pole at the date, again, is uh, expressed in the time uh, quantity t. And now uh, we describe the precession notation parts with the matrix uh, capital Q. And as you can see, the elements of this uh, matrix are uh, depending on X and Y. X and Y are the reference directions, Cartesian coordinates of the celestial intermediate pole with respect to GCRS. Now in between, uh, when we compare the intermediate reference systems, terrestrial and celestial reference systems, we can realize the Earth rotation as such, and the Earth rotation in this definition happens at the intermediate pole equator. <clears throat> the intermediate pole equator we now express with a single rotation, just uh, one rotation around the z-axis if you want. Uh, we require the knowledge of the Earth's rotation angle. And the Earth's rotation angle is nothing else than the distance on the equator of the celestial origin to the terrestrial origin. So this would be the projected origin of longitude, where longitude is zero, and the celestial intermediate origin is the projected origin from the celestial equator where right ascension is zero. Uh, additionally, we uh, do some small corrections. Uh, all are small rotations in uh, along the third axis. And this is done to achieve the Earth's rotation angle a bit more independent from uh, both from the precession notation model as well as from the polar motion model. Now, this Earth rotation angle is actually a modern version of sidereal time. So in the past, uh, sidereal time quantities were the Greenwich apparent sidereal time and Greenwich mean sidereal time to give some examples. Now, the modern version is the Earth rotation angle. This is a sidereal time defined on the celestial immediate pole equator. And uh, the Earth rotation angle has a very simple uh, functionality with respect to mean solar time ut1. It is, in fact, a defining equation, which is just a linear equation. As you can see, we have a constant plus a linear uh, trend, a linear factor applied on a ut1 date. And as we uh, evaluate this equation, we have a we can display the Earth rotation angle with respect to mean solar time. So it means that uh, the UT1 measurement today is achieved by measuring ERA with VLBI and then applying this defining equation to arrive uh, a measure of UT1. UT1 is uh, a time scale of very high practical relevance. It is the principal form of universal time. Uh, as I said already, it is a mean solar time. So it's an annual averaged apparent solar time. And uh, this is the time scale associated to the uh, rotation of Earth plus the orbital motion of Earth around the sun. So this is the time scale required to match today's noon with the highest position of the sun uh, above the horizon. And uh, UT1 is actually used to steer international atomic time to be uh, close to the sun's apparent position. So this is achieved by the definition of universal time coordinated, UTC. UTC in itself is a hybrid time scale um, as it adopts the uh, very precise standard time interval, the second from International Atomic Time, TIA, uh, with some uh, small corrections. And uh, at the same time, UTC is steered to be uh, close to UT1. So the uh, rule is that the difference to UT1 is not allowed to exceed 0.9 seconds. 
And this makes uh, UTC a useful civil uh, time scale. It, is, uh, it adheres to the TAI second. At the same time, it's very close to the mean solar time. So that's why it's used uh, for civil applications, such as the Turkish national time. Now we come to the uh, data sets that are used for Earth orientation description. And here we have the so-called EOP. EOP stands for Earth Orientation Parameters. And these are, in fact, five different parameters. Uh, first of all, we have DX, DY. These are two parameters that describe small differences to the um, Cartesian XY position of celestial pole. The Cartesian XY positions are predicted with standard models from International Astronomical Union. Then we have a DUT1, which is UT1 minus UTC, as I explained on the last slide. So this represents the Earth's rotation angle, so to say. And then we have the two components in polar motion. And a parameter set different from the EOPs are the ERPs. Uh, this is a short for Earth's rotation parameters. And these are just three parameters typically involving LOD, which is the excess length of day, nothing else than the negative first time derivative of UT1, and again, the polar motion components. Uh, if you study literature in some other uh, references, you might find here UT1 instead of LOD. I personally, I prefer, so to say, LOD here, because uh, with this definition, the ERP are the parameters that can be determined by satellite techniques. And this is my next slide. In this slide, I show you a theoretical um, demonstrative uh, orbit in, in, in Earth orbit. <clears throat> so we have the satellite's position here, and we have the classical uh, Keplerian parameters or Kepler elements, uh, which are the line of ascending node, the perigee, distance, inclination. And as you study these orbital parameters, uh, you can see that these orbital parameters have 100% correlation to uh, the celestial part of the Earth's orientation parameters. So for example, if you have a change in the ascending node, which is here, it is just like the same as a negative change of the Earth's rotation angle. So the satellite techniques cannot clearly uh, distinguish between the shift of this parameter and the shift of the Earth's rotation angle. And uh, as the orbital parameters are typically disturbed or perturbed by all kinds of forces, gravitational as well as non-gravitational, which are never perfectly predictable, uh, the satellite-based techniques, in fact, have problems to uh, derive these parameters here free of long-term drifts. For this reason, uh, VLBI is used to monitor these parameters. Now, uh, we have a, a nice overview slide here for all the space geodetic techniques that are currently used for the computation of ITRF. And uh, the slide here tries to discuss how suitable this technique is uh, for the derivation of Earth orientation information. An additional technique is involved in the uh, discussion here, which is lunar laser range. So we start and uh, distinguish the various levels of infrastructure as defined for JIGOS. First of all, we can mention the technique of VLBI. VLBI is the direct realization of the GCRS. For this reason, VLBI is uh, theoretically the optimal technique to derive Earth orientation parameters because it is exactly in agreement with theory. <coughs> But of course, all the systems have measurement errors. Then we have lunar laser ranging. Lunar laser ranging establishes the reference frame of the moon, and it can very well describe the rotational motions with respect to the lunar orbit. The lunar orbit is relative well uh, integratable over longer uh, time spans. 
for that reason, uh, the lunar orbit is relatively well establishing a reference plane with respect to which we can also refer the Earth orientation parameters. But lunar laser ranging is not very often done. It is only available at night times and you have to have good weather conditions and other constraints. Then we have the very well established satellite techniques, uh, GNSS, SLR and also DORIS. Um, besides of the defect uh, to determine the celestial part of the AOP, these satellite techniques are very, very well uh, qualified to uh, establish uh, estimates of the Earth's rotation parameters. And just as a, a side comment, the best uh, set of AOP is certainly obtained through a very good and correct combination of the various techniques. Now I would like to go through the time series of the Earth orientation parameters with you. And for each uh, Earth orientation parameter, I will give you a small introduction to the relevant science that is possible with that. So we start the small journey with the celestial pole offset. Here the uh, X correction, uh, celestial pole offset DX. So here in the upper plot, you see the, the quantity as such. And in the lower plot, you see the one sigma formula. And I uh, show you here three different products. <clears throat> in, in red, you find a standard um, AOP dataset of the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service, which are the CO4. In green, you see the other standard product of the IRS, which are bulletin A. And in blue for comparison, I uh, plot here an additional solution, which is derived just by the uh, IVS combination center. And it is the uh, product that was delivered to Zuher Altamimi for the computation of the ITRF 2014 for this reason, the data set stops in the year 2015. <clears throat> so we can see in general that these data sets have relative good agreement, in particular in the later years, not so well in the earlier years. We can also study the one sigma formal errors, uh, where we see that the blue dots are always a little bit below green and red dots. So it means the blue arrows a bit more optimistic. And uh, uh, this is probably an indicator why um, consistent long-term stable AOPs might provide better repeatabilities than, uh, for example, uh, bulletin A. Now the other parameter for the celestial pole is just the uh, in y direction uh, provides the, an identical picture. So there's no more comment from my side. I would like to go into the discussion of the signal that we see in here. So obviously there is a, a variation here of celestial pole with time, and this is a free core notation. Free core notation, FCN, is um, a process that comes into play because the Earth as such is not a homogeneous body, which has uh, in its interior completely identical physical and chemical features, but Earth has different layers, so to say. One of the layer would be the mantle, another layer would be the core. And the core and mantle do, of course, have different physical, also chemical properties. For example, in terms of liquidity, the core, at least the outer core, is considered as fluid, whereas the mantle shows uh, visual elastic properties. And because of these uh, properties, we can expect slightly different behavior uh, in terms of um, rotation. And the interplay between these two layers inside Earth uh, is causing the free core notation. But uh, we can observe uh, the free connotation with VLBI very well, but we can still in geophysics not 100% correctly explain what uh, processes are exciting it. But uh, if we study these free connotation time series, we can also transform in amplitude and phase domain. And we see, for example, at the year, approximately at the year 2000, that we have a 
a drift change in the amplitude of free connotation as well as an interesting uh, phase shift uh, in the free connotation signal. And uh, we, uh, in a study uh, at GFZ, we tried to uh, uh, investigate the reason for this interesting feature in free connotation. And uh, the, the design, the approach that we followed was we compared with information about the Earth's magnetic field. So we know that the Earth's magnetic field is uh, propelled through the Coriolis force driven by Earth rotation and uh, in uh, formed by um, uh, these uh, cylindrical uh, flows of liquid metal, probably iron and nickel, inside the outer part of the Earth's core. And um, as we know that this region in the Earth's interior creates the Earth's magnetic field, but it also con uh, is the reason, the driving mechanism for the free connotation. For that reason, we compare in a recent study uh, published just a week or two weeks ago, we compare uh, geomagnetic activity with the free connotation. And this is shown here in this uh, graph where the blue shaded areas um, are associated with secular accelerations of the Earth's dipole uh, field, uh, magnetic field. And the red areas are associated with sudden changes in the geomagnetic activity that are called geomagnetic jerks. And the, whereas the, the figure shows uh, the uh, celestial pole offsets and um, uh, not, uh, quantified through a so-called change index. And you can see that during the phases where we see changes in the magnetic uh, activity, we also see the free connotation change. So there's a very high correlation. The next question that we should ask uh, studying the Earth's interior and its contributions to Earth orientation is the inner core. Inner core has slightly different properties. Again, it's believed to be solid or maybe a plasma. Um, and it certainly has different properties than the outer core that is the one responsible for geomagnetic fields. So the question is asked uh, and repeatedly asked, where is the contribution to free connotation from the inner core? And in a recent study uh, conducted uh, four years ago, together with Spanish colleagues, we have analyzed a corrected time series of the celestial pole offset where we removed the uh, free core from the outer core and also corrected the late with latest values the notation terms and doing so we analyzed the residual spectrum and found interestingly peaks at 2069 and 1034 day periods in the retrograde spectrum that are high above the three sigma error floor and uh, we studied the literature these signals uh, are in other uh, um, articles actually related to gravitational interaction between outer and inner core. So we do not claim that we find free inner core notation, but it looks promising. The next quantity of the Earth's rotation is uh, UT1. Actually, the difference of mean solar time to uh, atomic time, the, the signal looks interrupted. So we see drifts and then we see jumps and every jump is of course just the introduction of a leap second. The uh, plot down here shows again one sigma error and um, I also plot in purple color here every other day I include uh, lunar laser ranging results uh, where I would like to acknowledge uh, that I got these values from the group in uh, University Hannover. Also, if you check the quality from lunar laser ranging at the at some nights, it is at the level of VLBI. So it's an interesting data set for comparison of UT1. Uh, then we look into the first time derivative, which is the excess length of day. This is this time series here, a bit shorter now. We start in the early 90s. The reason is we involve additional techniques in here. First of all, we have now a satellite laser ranging solution, which is shown here in magenta. And on top in black, we have a, a GNSS solution included. And uh, 
we can, for example, in the error, very clearly demonstrate that GNSS establishes the de facto error noise floor for the uh, estimation of LOD because it is on the bottom here in comparison to all the other techniques. Yeah, as you know, uh, uh, length of day <clears throat> has a secular uh, increase. It means that the rotation of Earth is slowing down on long uh, time scale. The physical cause of this is tidal friction. Tidal friction is an interplay of the angular momentum of Earth, the rotating Earth with the lunar orbit in, around Earth. As the, um, as the tidal peak is always a bit in advance in comparison to the di reference direction to the moon, Earth is always a bit uh, accelerated against its rotational direction. At the same time, the lunar um, um, velocity is a bit accelerated in its orbital direction. So it, this, uh, this uh, mutual interchange of angular momentum leads to a slightly higher velocity of moon uh, if you have an orbiting system where you increase velocity of the orbiter you get a larger distance and this distance is um, uh, what we can measure for example with lunar laser ranging and the, the value from lunar laser laser ranging is at the level of four centimeter per year so the earth's orbit is increasing and uh, when we study uh, long-term information such as using fossil uh, repositories uh, which allow to go back millions of years from now we can see that this is an effect that accumulates to quite a number of seconds over time <clears throat> now we go to the next set of parameters which are the polar motion polar motion has an x and a y component and here we can also include the, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the cyan uh, color here is now a, a, an additional technique. This is Doris solution from International Doris Service, uh, which is also a very interesting data set. You can see that in comparison to the other techniques, its formal errors are a bit larger, but still it's uh, an interesting contributor to Earth rotation. The Y component just looks similar. Now we see in polar motion, in particular over long time, we see interesting long-term drift. So polar motion shows secular uh, drifts and these secular drifts now are interesting in science to find the uh, causes of them. So in this recent paper by Atikari and Ivans, uh, surface effects of the Earth's surface are analyzed uh, mutually to find the agreement between modeled and observed long-term polar motion trends. And we can see that these agree, but not perfectly. Surface effects, for example, is the, is the ice melting over Greenland, is also Antarctic ice melting, but also, also uh, total water storage um, from the continents, atmospheric and oceanic, and like uh, land glacier effects. And the sum of which is not able to explain observed long-term polar motion. For that reason, long-term polar motion is obviously also forced by Earth's interior processes. Um, in this uh, sketch here, I show you an, uh, such a situation. So for example, in the Earth's mantle, you could have uh, mass uh, deficiencies and also uh, higher densities, uh, excess masses, because of the rotational motion of Earth, the uh, excess masses tend to move towards the equator to the rot rotational plane, and the lower uh, uh, mass deficiencies would tend to move to the polar uh, axial regions. So this causes um, also a polar motion, and uh, this the cause would come from the Earth's interior in this, in this case. A problem in discussing the uh, secular polar motion is always that it is very difficult to separate, in fact, the true polar motion, polar wonder, from the plate tectonics, which is uh, establishing different sets of surfacial velocities. Now, I would like to present another information to you that concerns the recent anomaly of Earth rotation parameters. 
I've taken these uh, plots here very recently, I think two days ago from uh, International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service. And this data set involves the newest values here in each plot. This is a UT1. Here you see LOD. And this is an example for the polar motion. So the recent Earth rotation is quite anomalous. It is uh, distinguishable at least from the last 60, 70 years. So currently we have very small Chandler and annual amplitudes in comparison to the recent decades. We have a very high rotation speed, which is unusual. We see this in an increase of uh, length of day, uh, sorry, a decrease in length of day, uh, or even into negative length of day, which means that the UT1, the Earth's rotational second, is in fact now faster than the atomic second, which is returning the effect uh, in UT1 which typically shows negative trend into a small phase of a positive trend. And if this anomaly uh, continues in a couple of uh, months or years, we would have to discuss whether we want to insert a negative leap second. And this is not the plan currently. Now I would like to also address uh, other sensors, other geodetic sensors that can be used to measure Earth rotation, and these are gravity observations. So, uh, for example, we can use uh, GRACE uh, releases, and also we could use SLR information. And how can we resolve Earth rotation from gravity? This works uh, slightly different. So the Earth's gravity field uh, contains, as we know, gravitational and centrifugal potentials. And inside, if we uh, have time variable gravity field, we can construct time series of the so-called Stokes coefficients. They're shown in here in these equations. And these Stokes coefficients reflect uh, the elements of the tensor of inertia of Earth. And the, ten the tensor of inertia allows the establishment of the Earth's principal axis of inertia. So we have here Earth rotation uh, measured with gravimetric technologies and the axial system is a different one. This is an axial system based on the tensor of inertia. And what we can see when we compare these axial systems with the ITRF axis uh, system, then we can see uh, drifts in some uh, components. And these drifts are interesting uh, from the point of view that um, for the uh, Earth rotation theory, we actually apply Earth models that use the ITRF axis, but um, we should in fact work with the principal axis of inertia and obviously these systems drift a bit with respect to each other. Okay, I conclude this presentation with some current topics, what is going on in the international community. Uh, at the moment, the, uh, we, the IRS, International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service, runs uh, two working groups. One working group is concerned with the consistency of the frames and the Earth rotation information. And the other working group is investigating how predictable the Earth orientation parameters are. And this is already the second campaign of this type. The, uh, our astronomical colleagues have a commission about Earth rotation. And in this commission, there is a working group ongoing on improving the theory and the models of the Earth rotation. And this is in fact in common with IAG. And now uh, the geodetic uh, scientific community is concerned with its commission three on Earth rotation and geodynamics. And it jointly operates this working group here uh, on improving the theory. That concludes my presentation and I stand ready now for questions. Uh, Professor Henkelmann, thank you so much for this uh, very informative and impressive pre presentation. And uh, do the attendees have any questions? Uh, 
up to now, I have not received any, but uh, I, I, I, I would like to uh, ask a question uh, related uh, to uh, the practical uh, issues about uh, on the space geodetic uh, uh, analysis of space geodetic observations. For instance, uh, when we are analyzing a session uh, for space geodetic uh, session, uh, we just uh, take several a priori from TRF, from CRF, or from orbital parameters from satellites and the EUPs. And uh, via these a priori should be somehow uh, accurate enough uh, because our observation equations are nonlinear. And uh, what is your uh, opinion about uh, for the future uh, regular uh, EUP series? Should it be possible to combine not only the four techniques, but also adding the uh, large uh, ring laser gyroscope observations and combining uh, somehow these uh, four, four techniques in addition, uh, in addition, uh, the gyroscope observations. Okay, thanks for the question. Concerning the first part of the question, uh, yes, we need accurate a priori information, but the requirement is not as strict as you might think. So to give you an example, for VLBI, the a priori coordinate should be about at one or two meter level precise. This would be sufficient so that the equation system, the linearized uh, adjustment works. And if it is uh, less precise, you can actually iterate the adjustment by inserting small corrections. So there, this is also possible. Um, and you can transfer this one meter into the uh, AOP as, as angles, and then you can apply uh, the same constraints for the AOPs. But now, uh, in reality, uh, of course, the, we get the best um, estimation, the better the a priori values are. This is clear because in VLBI, we are not adjusting observations. We adjust observed minus computed. So the computed part, which is computed from the a priori contributes also to the results. So the finer we can predict uh, a priori values, the better. Now coming to the uh, sub daily variation that you are asking for, uh, for the Earth orientation parameters, um, we, uh, you mentioned uh, the application of this inertial rotational sensors to get um, highly resolved Earth rotation information. Well, first of all, the um, local inertial system that is uh, uh, created by the um, gyroscopes uh, cannot be directly compared to the mechanism that we use for the global Earth orientation parametrization. So it means it refers to a slightly different reference system. It is probably not possible without um, transformations to use this information right away. Uh, it, it would probably only show uh, contributions to polar motion. And, um, and for, for this reason, it would be probably very suitable. Um, but it is probably not uh, possible to get uh, high frequent CPO, celestial pole offset variations, because this uh, is a different reference system. Um, and with this information, you could, um, if you do everything uh, with high precision, you could in fact get better sub daily estimates. Um, and that would be an interesting application to test out, for example, for the VLBI analysis, um, but uh, the way we estimate AOP at the moment um, in a standard procedure estimates um, average values per day. So um, yes, you could, if you go into sub daily Earth orientation information, you could maybe get a better, uh, a higher resolution, sub daily AOP, but the average value uh, the journal average value is probably not so much affected um, by this. So this is something, yes, is possible, and it would also be scientific interesting uh, from my point of view, but I, I cannot promise that you can uh, improve uh, the long-term 
uh, earth orientation information and in particular not the reference frames with such an approach. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Henkenman, for uh, giving us the opportunity to listen to you and uh, accepting our invitation of uh, giving a, this brief uh, presentation. And uh, if uh, there is not any comment uh, professor, from Professor Ozudemir, uh, uh, I will uh, end the first part of this session. Uh, due to the, uh, <clears throat> we are a little bit late from, uh, a little bit late in order to, uh, in order to uh, uh, stick into timeline, uh, we need to shift a little bit uh, the break. Uh, about five minutes later, uh, at the three past half past three in uh, Turkey's uh, uh, local time, we will begin uh, to the second part of this session, uh, which will be related to the uh, vertical reference frames and uh, <clears throat> managed. Uh, or uh, Professor Özdemir will help you in that part. So, uh, see you uh, after uh, break, uh, about five minutes later. <clears throat> dear, distinguished, dear distinguished speakers and uh, attendees, uh, welcome to the uh, second part of the fourth session of uh, the annual meeting of, uh, annual scientific meeting of the Turkish National Geodesy Commission. The uh, session's title is uh, Reference Coordinates Frames. Those are uh, the basic uh, parts of the geodetic infrastructure, the networks, and the realization uh, of the reference frames are also important. In the first part of this session, we had uh, informative uh, talks about the realization processes of celestial and terrestrial frames. And uh, in the second part, we continue with the same topics. Let me. This sketch is by Bülent Arabacıoğlu, showing the relation between the geodetic networks and uh, reference, reference frames. Actually, the networks play the most important role in this context. The German uh, geodesist, geodesist and mathematician and geodesist Heinrich Bruns uh, had a dream, a dream of uh, having a global network that was called as Bruns Cage. Thanks to the uh, development of the space-based geodetic techniques and the establishment of the uh, IGS, we have now a global network. And this is an ongoing process. Uh, this will be uh, probably realized also for the vertical frames as well. In this session, in this part of the session, uh, there will be invited speakers focusing on these issues. Our first speaker is Dr. Ali Sankurt uh, from General Directorate of MAPIC. Uh, he is going to present the realization process of the TUREF. In the latest, latest revised version of the regulations for large scale mapping and uh, map information production, which is the official specifications, official uh, specifications regarding the geodetic networks. We had a new definition, TUREF. His presentation will be regarding the uh, TUREF, the National Reference Frame. So I would like to first give uh, his short biography. Uh, Dr. Ali Sankur is the head of the Geodesy Department of the uh, General Directorate of Map Mapping of Turkey. His main uh, interests are establishment and maintenance of the geodetic networks, three-dimensional geodetic networks, and the uh, GNSS data processing and time series analysis using those uh, data collected at three-dimensional networks. And the uh, title of his presentation is Semi-Kinematic Reference Frame Realization in Turkey and Determination of an Improved Velocity Field Model. Together with uh, Ali Değerli Özbürger, Ayhan Cingöz, Uğur Doğan, and Sem Semih Ergintal, uh, he has prepared this presentation. Uh, you can start your presentation, Dr. Kurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Is it ready? Yes, it, it is seen now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my uh, presentation will cover uh, two parts. Uh, one is semi-kinematic uh, reference frame realization in Turkey, and uh, the other, uh, the second part is the determination uh, of an improved velocity field model. Uh, shortly, uh, our geodetic datum evolution in Turkey uh, uh, the work starts in 1930s and our uh, classical triangulation networks datum was ED50 and it was uh, realized by observations to and from eight sites in Bulgaria and Greece. Uh, in 2001, uh, we changed our, changed our datum uh, ED50 to TREF, uh, shortly TREF, uh, Turkish reference frame. Uh, which is uh, actually uh, ITRF 96 uh, at epoch 2005. Uh, we chose uh, that uh, uh, frame, ITRF uh, version, uh, because uh, during the uh, establishment of our uh, fundamental uh, GNSS network, uh, the current uh, release, uh, formal uh, ITRF release uh, was ITRF 96. Uh, so what we do uh, in our uh, TREF, uh, we uh, calculate uh, the uh, positions and velocities in the current uh, ITRF version. Uh, actually, it's ITRF 94, 194, uh, ITRF 14. Uh, we uh, transform uh, the coordinates and velocities using the uh, similarity transformations and parameters uh, given uh, by IGM France. Uh, this publication uh, highlighted in yellow uh, is the uh, ITRF 2014 publication uh, by Altamini and colleagues, uh, but this publication gives uh, the parameters uh, between uh, 2014 and 2008, but IGN France uh, gives the whole parameters uh, between ITRF 14 and previous versions. So uh, we use these uh, uh, seven parameters uh, at epoch 2010 and the velocities of these uh, parameters. Uh, about our uh, fundamental networks, uh, first fundamental geodetic network uh, is Turkish National Fundamental Genesis Network, uh, shortly called uh, in Turkish TUTKA, uh, established uh, through the Turkey uh, with uh, 600 sites. And uh, now with revision surveys, uh, with densification, it's about uh, 700 sites at the moment. Uh, we visit sites uh, at uh, three to uh, five years intervals. Uh, approximately 200 uh, sites are visited annually. And uh, of course, we uh, visit the sites uh, which were exposed to major earthquakes to update the coordinates. And GPS data processes are done with the latest ITRF version and then the coordinates and velocities are transformed to TREF to, to provide unification. About this network, um, uh, mostly the pillars, but uh, uh, pillars are uh, more uh, exposed to vandalism than benchmarks. We stopped uh, uh, establishing pillars, and uh, besides, uh, we stopped uh, cl using classical uh, tripods, and uh, we started using uh, UNAVCO, uh, uh, three pods. Uh, our national permanent GPS networks and cross TR networks, uh, TUSAGA, uh, shortly, uh, established particularly to monitor geodetic, geodynamical activities in the country to serve as a reference network. And uh, TUSAGA Active or Cross TR network uh, is an RTK network consisting of uh, 158 sites to serve real-time position information for a variety of applications such as mapping, GIS, and cadastral applications. 
we have two control centers uh, in this network. And uh, what we do uh, in, at uh, General Directorate, Directorate of Mapping uh, is um, daily GPS processing and time series analysis. Uh, in uh, course TR network, we also provide one hertz static data after the main earthquakes for geophysical studies. Uh, two days before and after the earthquakes, uh, anyone can download uh, the data and uh, analyze this data. And we publish uh, coordinates and velocities of uh, these course TR and Saga networks uh, at the uh, GDM's website. Uh, we also have new IJ sites from Turkey uh, belonging to these uh, permanent uh, networks, uh, Izmir, uh, Kars, and Mersin. And uh, we are hoping to uh, get the coordinates and uh, velocities uh, in the next ITRF versions. And we will have the chance that these sites will be included in the next ITRF solutions and uh, we will use them for datum definition. Uh, we uh, we are the uh, national representative for UREF, and uh, we contribute to two uh, UREF uh, working groups. Uh, one is EPN densification working group, which is chaired by Ambrush Kanyeres, and the other one is European Dense Velocities working group, which is chaired by Elmar Brockman. And uh, uh, to EPN densification working group, uh, we uh, supplied 12.5 uh, years of weak Sinex files. And to European Dense Velocities Working Group, uh, we uh, provided uh, ETRF 2000 velocities of uh, 164 stations uh, by using uh, the uh, transformation parameters uh, given in this uh, Euro Technical Note 1 document. And uh, the second part of my presentation is uh, the uh, velocity field modeling for Turkey. Uh, in this project, uh, we have two main uh, uh, motivations. Uh, one is uh, to present a standard uh, velocity field uh, for users as necessitated uh, by large scale mapping and geospatial data production directive in Turkey. Uh, we would like to uh, give a standard uh, velocity field because uh, users uh, may uh, may face problems, uh, especially along the uh, main fault zones. Uh, they may uh, have problems uh, whether deciding uh, which uh, sites to choose for uh, giving their uh, sites to velocities. And the other motivation is uh, to give a uh, homogeneous velocity field for tectonic studies. Uh, in the slide, uh, you can see uh, uh, some uh, velocities uh, in the literature. Uh, they, they have some uh, little differences. Uh, we would like to uh, give a, a unique uh, and homogeneous uh, and the reference uh, velocity field uh, for covering the Turkey. Uh, we started the project with the uh, uh, universities. Uh, firstly, we reprocessed all historical uh, GPS data starting from 1992 to 2020. Uh, uh, uh, we used uh, Gantt uh, GPS software uh, for daily processes and uh, we used uh, GeoLog module to uh, define data. We used uh, 33 uh, stations in our project and uh, reference frame uh, is ITRF uh, 14 and we uh, transferred our coordinates to our uh, national data. Uh, these are uh, some examples uh, from the time series. Uh, one is the campaign site and other is a monthly uh, a permanent site. But uh, all the sites, uh, permanent and campaign type sites, are uh, combined uh, in one uh, combination. Uh, we cross-checked the velocities that were obtained from the combination. Uh, we use 
uh, cross validation and strain analysis uh, techniques uh, to remove outlier uh, velocities. And our uh, final velocity field, as you can see uh, on the uh, slide, uh, we have uh, 836 sites uh, for, for this uh, project. Uh, mainly uh, Tutka sites, uh, Korsiar and Tusaga sites, geodynamic sites. Uh, you can see two IGS sites here. Uh, some local networks, uh, magnet, uh, and uh, some uh, other local networks. Uh, we uh, calculated interstitial distances uh, between these sites to uh, have a grading space. Uh, for our interpolations, mean inter uh, mean uh, interstitial distance uh, is uh, 37 kilometers, and we used uh, this uh, to uh, have an idea uh, for gridding space, and we chose uh, 0 0.1 degrees for interpolation. And uh, more than half of the sites have four or more epochs, as you can see on the slide. And uh, also more, more than half of the sites have uh, 15 to 20, uh, 24 years of uh, observation interval. Finally, we get uh, the uh, velocity field in TREF datum for uh, gridding and uh, velocity field with respect to Eurasia uh, for tectonic studies. Uh, ITREF 2014 plate motion model described in Altanini uh, at all uh, 2017 is used uh, for this uh, velocity field. Uh, we used cluster analysis uh, for uh, grading uh, purposes. Uh, we used hierarchical agglomerative uh, clustering uh, technique for grouping our sites. And as you can see on the slide, uh, the, the sites are grouped uh, mainly on the uh, mainly between the main faults, fault zones, and uh, we found uh, five uh, groups, uh, optimum groups uh, for uh, clustering. Uh, on the slide, you can also see the uh, lines uh, that are passing through the regions. And final uh, velocity field in TREF uh, data. Uh, for grading uh, purposes, and uh, we uh, graded these uh, velocities uh, for the uh, for mainly the uh, large scale uh, mapping procedure, uh, producer users. Uh, we created a, a web application uh, for test purposes uh, at the moment because the, the uh, directive updating is uh, ongoing now. Uh, but we are uh, waiting for uh, user feedbacks uh, for this uh, velocity field. And uh, uh, any user uh, uh, giving uh, his uh, latitude and longitude can get uh, to have uh, velocities in uh, Cartesian format. Uh, finally, we have uh, two uh, main outputs uh, in this project. Uh, one is TREF velocity field for interpolation and uh, Eurasia velocity field for tectonic studies. Uh, updating of the large uh, scale mapping directives uh, ongoing uh, and uh, TREF velocity field uh, is uh, open to users for uh, test purposes uh, at the moment uh, until the uh, update of the uh, directive. <laughs> and uh, publication uh, preparation of the Eurasia velocities is ongoing. Uh, we would like to uh, publish it uh, on the Turkish Journal of Earth Sciences, uh, Barka Special Edition. And uh, we plan to include neighboring countries' station data for avoiding extrapolation at the borders. And uh, we would like to include other stations uh, operated by universities and municipalities for better spatial resolution. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your uh, informative. Uh, Mr. Chairman, shall I go go on with the uh, Turkish version or stop for questions?
you you can continue of course uh, I, I i i should have mentioned about the presentation slide uh, this is a hybrid presentation actually uh, we ask the uh, speakers to give their presentations in english they kindly accepted our uh, request so but the, the presentations were actually in turkish so they continue uh, summarize the uh, presentation in Turkish language as well. So this is the Turkish section. Thank you. Ee, ekrana geldi herhalde hocam. Evet geldi hocam. Geldi. Tamam. Ee, sayın katılımcılar hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Ee, güncel türev hız alım modelinin uzun dönemli genesis verilerinin yeniden değerlendirilmesiyle oluşturması e, konulu takdim iki bölümde yapacağım. Ee, birinci bölümde e, türefin gerçekleşimi Türkiye'de e, bu e, çalışma bu oturumun konusuyla ilgili olarak bir de e, yaptığımız bu TÜREF e, hız alanı modeliyle ilgili bahsedeceğim. E, Türkiye Ulusal Datum'umuz e, malumuz e, öncelikle Türkiye Ulusal Datum'u 54 olarak oluşturuldu. Daha sonra Bulgaristan ve e, Yunanistan'dan 8 noktayla E50 e, datumunu e, tanımladık. E, bu datumda deformasyon ölçüleri kısıtlı fakat 44 Bolu depreminden 2 sene sonra e, bazı ölçülerde e, yapıldığını e, görüyoruz. E, i̇ki metrelik atımların e, bu ölçülerle tespit edildiğini görüyoruz. Ve aktif deformasyonun yoğun olduğu e, bölgelerde de referans sistemlerinin iyileştirilmesinin e, kaçınılmaz olduğu bir gerçek. E, uydu ölçmeleri e, tabanlı modern jeodezik e, ağları geçtiğimizde öncelikle e, malumuz Tutka e, ağımızı kurmuştuk 97-99 yıllar arasında. E, 2001 yılında ise E50 batumundan türef batumuna geçtik ve 2005 yılında güncellenen e, büyük ölçekli harita yapım yönetmeliğinde de hız kavramı e, yönetmeliğe girdi ve tüm e, kullanıcılar e, ürettikleri noktalarda aynı zamanda hızlarını e, hesaplama e, hesaplamaktadırlar bu yönetmeliğe göre. E, türef e, batumumuz bizim e, ITRF 96 ve EPOC 2005'te bu da e, Tutkan'ın kurulduğu yıldaki e, ITRF versiyonu olan e, ITRF 96 seçilmişti. Bu yarı kinematik bir referans sistemi. E, bu ne demek? Biz e, hesap epoğunda aldığımız noktayı e, daha sonra epok 2005'e getirerek tüm e, şeyde bir e, tüm noktalar için veya aynı noktada ölçü yapan tüm kullanıcılar için e, tek bir e, koordinat hesaplanmasını öngörüyoruz. Yarı kinematik referans sistemi bu. E, referans sistemlerinden çok bahsetmeme gerek yok çünkü şeyde zaten bahsedilmişti e, benden önceki sunumlarda çok detaylı bir şekilde bahsedilmişti e, ITRS'in e, realizasyonu e, ITRF olarak e, malumunuz gerçekleşmekte e, ITRS'te e, ITRS'ten ITRF'e geçerken e, farklı çözümler var burada da e, 88 90 90 e, çözümleri artık görünmüyor bile. Fakat e, diğer çözümler bunlar. E, biz ITRF e, 2014'te şu an e, tüm hesaplamalarımızı yapıyoruz ve de ITRF 14'ten de e, TÜREF'e e, bir benzerlik dönüşümüyle e, noktalarımızı, koordinatlarımızı dönüştürüyoruz. Ve de hızlarımızı. Çünkü ITRF 14 ile ITRF e, 96'nın hızları da farklı. E, burada e, Çeyit tarafından e, Altabimi e, tarafından e, ITRF 2014'ün e, yayını var. Burada ITRF 14'ten ITRF 2008'e olan e, dönüşüm parametreleri ve hızları var. E, fakat e, ITRF 14'ten 96'ya IGN Fransa tarafından yayınlanmış e, ITRF 14'ten tüm ITRF'lere dönüşüm parametreleri var. <gülüyor> Sonuç olarak bizim kullandığımız parametreler 
2010 EPO'nda ve e, hızları bunlar. Bu parametreleri e, benzerlik dönüşümü kullanarak e, TÜREF datumuna dönüştürüyoruz. Ne yapıyoruz? Dönüşüm parametrelerinin öncelikle hızlarını kullanarak yani şu parametrelerin şu hızlarını hemen şeyi açayım, işaret açayım. E, dönüşüm parametrelerinin hızlarını kullanarak bu dönüşüm parametrelerini 2010 EPO'nda bu parametreler verilmiş durumda. Bunu 2010 EPO'ndan hesap EPO'na getiriyoruz. Hesap EPO'na getirdiğimiz e, ITRF e, 2014 koordinatlarını da e, ITRF 96'ya getiriyoruz. Bunu da e, nasıl yapıyoruz? ITRF e, 2014 hızlarını ITRF e, 96 hızlarına dönüştürüyoruz. <gülüyor> ITRF e, 96 ve 14 hızları farklı demiştim. E, burada bir epok kavramı yok. Hızların birbirine dönüşümünde. Yalnızca dönüşüm parametrelerinin hızlarını biraz önceki yansıda gösterdiğim şurada şu formülden e, dönüşüm parametrelerinin hızlarını kullanarak e, ITRF 96 hızlarını ITRF 14 hızlarından hesaplıyoruz. E, hesap epoğunda e, belirlediğimiz ITRF 96 koordinatlarını da ITRF, e, şurada belirlediğimiz ITRF 96 hızlarını kullanarak Referans epoğumuz olan TÜREF'in referan, referans epoğu 2005'e getiriyoruz. Ee, i̇kinci bölümde e, Türkiye için hız alanı belirleme çalışmalarından bahsetmek istiyorum. E, bu bizim e, üniversitelerle beraber yaptığımız bir çalışma. E, buradaki temel motivasyonumuz e, büyük ölçekli harita ve harita bilgileri üretim yönetmeliğinin de kapsamında kullanıcılara standart bir hız bilgisi sağlamak. Malumunuz e, bu yönetmelikte kullanıcılardan e, hız bilgisi de istenmekte. E, ve teknolojik çalışmalar için de ülke çapında homojen bir hız alanı sunmak istiyoruz. <gülüyor> Bu yönetmelik kapsamında kullanıcılar e, ne türlü sıkıntılar yaşıyor? Örneğin ana fay zonları çevresinde e, de ki bir kullanıcı hangi noktaları e, seçeceği konusunda kararsız kalabiliyor. Çünkü bu e, yönetmelikte e, ana fay zonları veya tektonik durumlar e, tarif edilmemiş durumda. Dolayısıyla e, kullanıcılara standart bir hız alanı vermek istiyoruz. E, yine e, literatürde farklı çalışmaları ekranda görmektesiniz. Tüm Türkiye için e, veya bölgesel bir çalışma yapmak e, isteyen bir araştırmacı e, bu hızlardan, bu hızları uygun yöntemlerle birleştirerek e, Avrasya datumunda bir hız alanı elde edebilir ve kullanabilir. Fakat biz tüm Türkiye için homojen bir hız alanı hazırlamak istiyoruz. Ağlarımızdan çok fazla bahsetmeme gerek yok. Zaten tanımaktasınız. Tutkağımız 97-99 yıllarında oluşturuldu. Ve yıllık 200 noktada güncelleme yapıyoruz. Dolayısıyla bizim bir noktayı ziyaret etme Süremiz 3 ve 5 yıl arasında değişiyor. 3 ee, boyutlu koordinatlarımızı da biraz önce anlattığım şekilde güncel ITRF datumunda hesaplıyoruz ve TÜREF datumuna dönüştürüyoruz. TÜSEG ağımız 21 istasyondan oluşuyor. TÜSEG aktif ağımızı artık çok iyi bilmektesiniz. <gülüyor> e, şundan bahsetmediğim TÜSEG aktif e, saniye yerlerini de e, biz e, büyük depremlerden sonra teknoloji çalışmalar için Kullanıcıları açıyoruz. İki gün önce ve iki gün sonrasını depremlerden önce ve sonra e, TÜSAG Aktif web sitesinden saniyelik verilerini yayınlıyoruz. E, bu hız alanı belirleme çalışmamızda e, ki aşamalarımızdan kısaca bahsedecek olursak e, bunları çabuk geçeceğim çünkü e, 2020 e, yılında harita dergisinin 164. sayısında aslında bu aşamalardan e, aşamalarını içeren bir e, yayınımız var. E, tüm verilerimizi yeniden proses ettik e, ve canlı bir ortamda topladık ve şu an e, yeniden prosesi hazır bir e, durumda verilerimiz. E, Gamut Globke'yi kullandık. Bunlar detaylı olarak e, bu yayınımızda var. E, referans sistemi tanımlamasında e, Globke ve Geolog modülü, modülünü kullandık. Hız hesaplamalarında e, depremleri e, tabii ki bir hız hesaplarken e, bir deprem atımındaki bir kesik, kesiklik oluşması durumunda e, lineer bir hız hesaplayamıyoruz. 
Dolayısıyla bazı e, büyük depremlerden sonra da atımlardan e, atımları e, dikkate aldık. Kampanya ve e, sabit istasyonlarımızı, e, sabit istasyonların aylık birleştirmeleri, e, kampanyaların yine birleştirmeleri, <gülüyor> e, bunların hepsini tek bir birleştirmede ele aldık. Yani kampanyaları ayrı, e, kampanyaları ayrı, sabit istasyonları ayrı çözmedik. Daha doğrusu ayrı çözümlerini yaptık fakat tüm o e, gevşek koşullu e, kampanya senelik verilerini e, ve de e, sabit istasyonların aylık birleştirmelerini tek bir birleştirmede ele aldık. E, önceki çalışmalara göre oldukça e, iyi sonuçlar elde ettik. Yine bunlar da yayınımızda yer almakta. Ve e, elde ettiğimiz hızları kontrol ettik çapraz doğrulama analizi ve strain analizlerine tabi tutarak sonuç veri setimizi elde ettik. 836 noktadan oluşan. Bunlar çoğunlukla tutka ve tutsak aktif noktaları. iki tane IGS istasyonumuz var. Yine bizim bu hız alanımıza katkı sağlayan hemen doğumuzda bulunan iki IGS istasyonu. Magnet ve Buski, Saski, İski istasyonlarında e, verilerini bu e, şey için, sıklaştırma için kullandık. E, ortalama e, 37 kilometre istasyon aralığı elde ettik. Bunu da bunun da üçte birini alarak e, gridleme aralığını 0.1 derece olarak belirledik. E, epok sayılarının dağılımını görmektesiniz. E, yarıdan fazlası e, 4 ve 5'den fazla epoklu noktalarımızın ve gözlem sürelerinde dikkatinizi çekmek istediğim yer 15 sene ve 20 sene arasında oldukça fazla şeyimiz var, noktamız var ve 20 senelik, 24 senelik, 26 senelik noktalarımız da var. Sonuç olarak ITRF datumunda nokta hızlarımızı elde ettik. Bunu büyük ölçekli yönetmelikte kullanmak istiyoruz. Büyük ölçekli yönetmelik için Kullanıcılara standart bir hız alanı sağlamak için kullan, kullanacağız. <gülüyor> Ve de Avrasya sabit sisteminde nokta hızlarını elde ettik. Bunu da teknolojik çalışmalar için e, kullanıcıların hizmetine e, sunmayı düşünüyoruz. Burada ITRF 2014 levha hız modelini kullandık. E, bu datumda elde etmek için. E, burada e, ITRF 2014 levha hız modelinde e, toplam 300 noktanın 100 e, noktası e, Avrasya e, levhasında olması aslında bu e, datumu tanımlamakta da oldukça e, bizim için büyük bir avantaj. E, e, kümeleme analizini kullandık. Bu ne için? E, gridleme e, yapmak için yani hangi gruplara ayırmamız lazım? Çünkü zaten e, buradaki problem e, kullanıcıların herhangi bir tektonik şeye bakmadan gridleme yapabilmesini sağlamaktı. Burada hiyerarşi, hiyerarşik yığınsal kümeleme analizini kullandık. Ve GAP istatistiğiyle optimum küme sayısını 5 olarak bulduk. Burada da bu kümelerde dikkat etmişseniz ana fay zonlarıyla oldukça uyumlu ve de Anadolu'nun batıya doğru olan hızlanmasıyla e, oldukça uyumlu. E, kümeleme analizi sonrasında e, bölgelerimizi belirlememiz gerekiyordu ve bunu e, faiz onların aslında bu durum e, çok zor fakat e, şey yapmamız gerekiyor mecburen bir e, çizgi belirlememiz gerekiyor ve bu hızları da bölgelere göre e, grid dosyalarına ayırdık. E, ve sonuç olarak bununla ilgili bir web uygulaması oluşturduk. Bu da bizim şu an Harita Genel Müdürlüğü'nün web sayfasında aktif olarak çalışmakta ve tüm kullanıcılarımızı bu <gülüyor> web sitesini kullanarak test etmelerini istiyoruz. Zaten şu an test amacıyla açık çünkü yönetmelik henüz bunun kullanımına müsaade etmiyor. Sonuç olarak hız alanı belirlemesinde tutka ve tutsak aktiflerden çok daha fazla 
nokta kullandık. E, jeodinamik noktalar, Marraf GNSS noktaları, magnet ağ istasyonları, sınır dışındaki IC istasyonları ve belediyelerin istasyonları gibi. E, güncel ve kümelere ayrılmış tüm kullanıcılar için standart bir hız alanı test ettik. <gülüyor> test amacıyla yayınlamaya başladık ve yönetmelikler komisyonunca bu e, şu an e, güncelleme çalışmaları e, devam ediyor. Ve tektonik çalışmalar için Avrasya sabit atımında hızların sunulması ile ilgili e, TÜBİTAN e, Journal of Earth Sciences Aykut Park özel sayısına bir yayın hazırlamaktayız. Ve önümüzdeki dönemde de sınır dışındaki derilerin ve ülkedeki diğer ölçü noktaların ağların dahil ederek hız alanının iyileştirilmesini e, planlıyoruz. Dinlediğiniz için çok teşekkür ederim. Çok teşekkür ederiz bu kapsamlı sunuşunuz için. Sadece bilimsel amaçlı çalışmalar çerçevesinde değil, aynı zamanda uygulama açısından da çok önemli bir çalışma. Thank you for your informative, very informative presentation. Katılımcılarımız sorularını yöneltebilirler. İngilizce ya da Türkçe dilimde ekranın sağ alt bölümünde yer alan sohbet modülündeki soru cevap bölümünde. I have seen that the Professor Altamimi raised his hand. Professor Altamimi, you can ask your questions or make your comments. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kurt for his nice presentation, which I followed, uh, of course, in English. Unfortunately, I don't speak uh, Turkish, it's, it's, except marhaba. <laughs> uh, uh, my question is for the two, two ref uh, reference frame. Uh, the users, your users, you are in charge uh, actually uh, uh, of the delivery of the tour of uh, solution, I mean uh, reference frame to the users. My question is to know if the users use only coordinate at epoch 2005.0 or do they use velocities? Because in your presentation you have nice pictures about the velocities in Turkey. And I have uh, two other questions, if I allow, uh, you allow me. Of course. Yes, of course. No, no, wait, uh, I, I need the answer for the first question. Okay. If the users okay. use uh, only uh, coordinate. <laughs> okay, uh, our users uh, use the uh, velocities uh, to uh, uh, <coughs> uh, process their data uh, in the uh, current epoch. Okay. After the current epoch, uh, when they get their new site coordinates, uh, they need uh, to uh, obtain uh, the new site coordinates in 2005, and they use uh, these velocities uh, at that moment. Because this, it is the legal uh, reference frame in Turkey. Yes. Uh, ITRF 96. At epoch 2000, uh, 2005.0. Is there any chance for you to change that reference frame, which is too old now, and the epoch itself, to be more up to up to date of what is happening in Turkey? Uh, excuse me, uh, the first part of question. I mean, uh, uh, is there any chance to change the? your reference frame to go, for instance, to ITRF 2014 and very soon to ITRF 2020 to be up to date in terms of what is happening in the, uh, the air surface. And uh, ITRF 2014 or ITRF 2020 will be more uh, precisely more geocentric reference frames. Yes, very nice question. Um, this is uh, actually uh, in our uh, topic. Uh, it's a current topic for us. Uh, while updating uh, our uh, directive, uh, we are uh, talking about uh, changing uh, ITF 96 to uh, 2020, uh, for example. But uh, this is a uh, this is a commission work, and uh, we should uh, ask commission uh, to decide. Uh, for this, because uh, there are many, many works uh, starting from 2005 uh, up to now, uh, calculated in uh, two ref data. Uh, of course, uh, we can handle this problem. 
we can give uh, a tr uh, transformation website, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, we should ask uh, our users for this. Okay. Thank you. I stop here for the interest of time because you are very late now. Maybe in the future we can uh, communicate together because I am interested to, uh, on your work and on what is happening in Turkey in terms of crustal deformation. You know, you have uh, post seismic deformation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So hopefully we can cooperate in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Başka sorusu olan katılımcımız yoksa zaman kısıtını da zamanı açtığımızda da göz önünde bulundurarak bir sonraki oturma geçirebilirim. There is no other question. Thank you very much for for your nice presentation. Doctor. Thank Dr. you. Mr. And our next speaker is uh, Professor Laura Laura Sanchez. She's going to make a presentation regarding the uh, global vertical reference frame towards a global vertical reference frame. The global unified uh, height system is the topic. I would like to give a brief uh, biography of uh, Professor Sanchez. She is the network representative of the International GNSS Service and vice president of the global geodetic, geodetic observing system of the International Association of Geodesy. She is working at the uh, German Geodetic Research Institute, DGFI, one of the prominent uh, institutions in Germany, and Munich Technical University. The principal research areas of Professor Sanchez are the vertical reference systems in general, and the realization of the globally unified height system as the uh, global uh, geodetic observing system project in particular. Thank you for, for being with us, Professor Sanchez. You can start, start your presentation. I, I thank you very much for the nice introduction. I also want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, it is really for me a pleasure to have the opportunity uh, of show you the recent achievements of the International Association of Geodesy towards the installation of a global unified height system. Um, before I start, I have to mention that everything what I will show you here in the next slides um, is possible thanks to the contributions of many, many colleagues worldwide. Uh, without their support, all this work would not be possible and and it's really, it's really uh, interesting to see how many people is contributing to, to this um, initiative. Uh, in a previous presentation, Suheir explained very, very well the importance of the geodetic reference frames. Without uh, geodetic reference frames of a well and high quality, it would be not possible to have a, a reliable earth system research. He mentioned also the importance uh, to have uh, reference frames with um, a, an order of accuracy higher than the magnitude of the effects we want to, to determine. So if we want to, to have um, the sea level rise with an accuracy of one millimeter per year or better, the reference frame has to provide a better accuracy than this that this um, signal, what we want to observe. The reference frames should provide consistency and reliability worldwide. So every, every, um, every, uh, everywhere around the world um, should be available the same accuracy. And this reference frame should be also uh, provided with a long-term stability. So we, we should be able to determine or to model that system in any in any epoch or at any time. Uh, we know the International Terrestrial Reference System and his realization is is a huge um, effort of the International Geodetic Committee. Uh, today we have a very very good reference. We can determine geometric coordinates uh, with a consistency uh, globally, and the accuracy of these coordinates um, 
at, at, the, at the millimeter or centimeter level in some, in some parts of the world. And they are better in other parts of the world. They are a little worse, but, but the mean accuracy is at the millimeter or the one centimeter level. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we can't not use the geometric coordinates to describe the motion of water. We use uh, ellipsoidal heights. The ellipsoidal heights uh, don't provide us with any information about water is flowing. So for that, we still need the physical height system, and this applies not only for the water, but also for any geophysical fluid. So the fluids that are oriented in the frame of the earth gravity field need a physical height system uh, for the representation and interpretation of the, ch the changes uh, through the time. Today, we have more than 100 realizations of physical heights worldwide. Most of them refer to the mean sea level determined at individual local tape gauges, and we know that the mean sea level is varying from time to time and from um, place to place, and therefore there are discrepancies at the decimeter or even at the meter level between the different uh, vertical datums. Most of the existing height systems are realized with static heights, you know, um, Leveling is very expensive and time consuming, and it is very, very complicated to determine or to repeat uh, the leveling networks um, in, huge co in huge countries or in large regions. And therefore, uh, it is still uh, assumed that the uh, leveling heights uh, don't change with time. Uh, the precise combination with geometric heights and global and um, geoid models is still complicated in some regions, most regions of the world. And in summary, um, the global consistency of the existing physical heights are one or two orders of accuracy less than the accuracy that we can reach with the IPRF. So, uh, one main objective of the International Association of Geodesy is to provide or to establish an international standard for the precise determination of physical heights worldwide. Uh, a first step in this direction was the release of an IUG resolution uh, at the IUGG General Assembly in 2015 in Prague. Uh, this resolution concentrates on the definition and realization of an international high reference system. Uh, this reference system is defined in terms of potential values, potential quantities, so the, the main or the primary coordinate, primary vertical coordinate are potential differences with respect to a conventional W0 value. So we need to determine the potential differences are the, our uh, points of interest with respect to this value. This value is fixed and adopted as convention, so it, it doesn't change. So the primary coordinate we, want, we need to estimate is this potential value. If we know the potential value at this point P, and we remove the reference W0 value, we can determine is it the geopotential number with respect to, a, to this global a reference surface. The determination of the potential value should be given a mm, determined IPRF potentials, or let's say the position in the space of this potential value is given by the IPRF, uh, IPRF position. And the determination of the potential values as well as the, the IPRF position should include the variations with time. The resolution also states that the coordinates for the IGRF should be given in the mean type system, and this is uh, um, was defined with the intention to support also um, uh, applications and research in ocean areas because the, the motion of the oceans and the ocean currents and all these oceanic models uh, are based in the mean type system. And the last convention uh, um, indicates that the 
unit for, uh, of length and the unit of time are the meter and the second. Uh, with this convention, we are making clear that the heights in the international height reference frame should be given in meters and not in inches or feet or any other um, met uh, metric unit. With the definition of the international height reference system, the next step is the realization of this definition. Uh, a reference frame realizes a reference system in two ways. One is a physical way, and this corresponds to a solid materialization of point of observing instrument instruments, these stations give us accessibility to the reference frame, to the reference system. And the second realization is mathematically. Uh, it concentrates on the determination of the coordinates of the reference stations, taking into account the measurements we have available for the determination. Here we show we should pay special attention to follow the definition of the reference system. Uh, from this point of view, uh, we are working on four main components for the implementation of the high reference system. The first component is the selection or establishment of a global reference network as a um, core element of the international high reference frame. The second component is the determination of the coordinates at the reference stations. The third component is a compendium of standard conventions and pressures to ensure that the realization of the reference frame is consistent with the definition of the, uh, the, in the reference system, the IHRS. And the fourth element is the establishment of an operational or organizational infrastructure to ensure the long-term stability of the high reference frame. Regarding the reference network, we decided to follow the same structure like the IPRF. So we need a global network with a worldwide distribution. Uh, this uh, global network uh, should contain a core network uh, that ensures the sustainability and long-term stability of the reference, the, reference, you know, the reference frame, and it should be extended by means of regional and national densification. This is exactly the same structure uh, applied to the IPRA. This core network should be collocated with the fundamental geodetic observatories, and this is to provide the connection between the reference frame the heights, the geometric reference frame, the height system, uh, the gravity reference frame, and the time realization. And our objective here is to provide an uh, infrastructure for the determination of potential difference uh, using the, the optical clocks. Uh, the core network should be also realized by continuously operating reference stations, uh, and this is to detect the formations of the reference frame in the same way like um, Suhey <laughs> had to model the Poseidon deformations in the computation of the IPRF. The physical heights of those points are also affected by, by this kind of, of, of uh, events. So we need to, to follow very well how the, the reference uh, frame is deforming. And therefore, we recommend that the primary uh, high reference frame stations should be coincide with IPRF uh, reference stations. And in those regions where, where no many IPRF stations are available, you, we should work with uh, the continental densifications like CIRGAT, in Latin America or the European permanent network in Europe of the reference frame in Asia, Asia Pacific, etc. Uh, we, we also recommend a collocation with the reference type pages and national vertical networks in order to support the vertical data modification of the existing high systems into the global one. And another recommendation is the collocation with the reference stations of the International Gravity Reference Frame to integrate gravity-type reference frames. 
uh, a main recommendation is however uh, to have a good distribution of surface gravity data around the reference stations in order to be able to ensure um, a precise determination of the potential path. According to this criteria, we start here to define the IHRF reference network in 2017. And after many interactions with the local and regional uh, colleagues um, working on reference frames and geoid modeling, we could uh, set, select a set of reference stations you can see here. They are about uh, 170 stations. Uh, this is a living, a living network. Some stations have to be decommissioned and other stations uh, have been integrated since that time. This is a living uh, work. And as mentioned, this, this 170 stations should be densified with regional and national uh, networks according to the necessity of each region or country. Um, since uh, two or three years, uh, our focus is the computation of the potential values for this station. So we have already the reference network. The next step is the next step is to compute the high reference frame coordinates for these reference stations. Uh, in this regard, uh, we have to point out that the, the high reference frame and system is not more than the combination of a geometric component given by the IPRF coordinates finding the position of the points and a physical component given by the determination of the potential values at the positions defined by the IPRF. It's clear that the IPRF is computed following the IRF conventions. A similar, a similar recommendation for the determination of the potential values uh, was not available. We are working on this, on this uh, documentation uh, during the last two, three years. Uh, to be in agreement with the reliabil reliability of the IPRF coordinate coordinates, it's expected that the accuracy of the potential values is about three millimeters in the vertical, okay. three millimeters uh, in the static uh, coordinate, and about 0.3 millimeters per year in the velocities. However, this is uh, a very, very optimistic. Um, goal. Uh, therefore, we decided for the moment to concentrate in achieving about one centimeter accuracy determination of the potential values or potential numbers, uh, in this case given in terms of, of heights. Uh, the definition of the high reference system uh, implies the determination of the change the time change that, uh, of the coordinates, uh, but for the moment we are not able to, to define this, these changes in time. So if we don't get a really good accuracy in the stat stated coordinates, it will be very, very difficult to, to get reliable changes with time of four. Uh, we have mainly three different approaches for the determination of the potential coordinates. The easiest one, uh, yeah, the easiest one, would be to introduce the IPRF coordinates in the equation of a global gravity model. Uh, one possibility is to use uh, these global gravity models of high resolution uh, extended with topographic potential signals from, uh, from um, computer or infer for different uh, topographic models. Other possibility is to use uh, the recent global gravity models which are included already synthetic gravity signals inferred from topography. 
The second uh, possibility is the precise uh, gravity field modeling, and this uh, is what we know as the solution of the gravity boundary value problem, geodetic boundary value problem. Uh, we have the reference potential of a reference ellipsoid. If we determine the anomalous potential, we can determine or infer the potential, the gravity potential at the point uh, of interest. This uh, anomalous or disturbing potential is exactly the same quantity we determine when we are computing the geoid or the quasi-geoid. So if we have a geoid or quasi-geoid models of a high resolution or high precision, we can infer from these existing models already the potential values. And the third possibility is the vertical data unification of the existing high systems into the global one. Uh, this depends, uh, or yeah, this depends on the um, on the so-called GNSS leveling approach. So we um, collocated stations or leveling points with collocated GNSS positioning to determine the IPLS coordinates of the leveling point. Uh, this is also a very good option. I cannot go into the details because we will we will need an, uh, another 20 minutes for this. So uh, just to mention that we have these three, three possibilities and I will mention some details about the first one and the second one. Uh, this slide, the slide shows the differences in terms of normal heights between the potential values inferred from different global gravity models, global gravity. And you can see that in some regions, uh, we have a stroke differences up to 35 centimeters, which is quite large if we think that we want to gap an accuracy of one centimeter. Uh, these differences uh, are mainly caused in this case uh, by new gravity data included in this uh, new model. So uh, after the release of the EGM 2000, 2008 model, uh, different uh, organizations worldwide uh, under the coordination of US uh, National Geointelligence uh, uh, Agency uh, could uh, um, collect new surface gravity data, some of them, or most of them, uh, airborne gravity data, and uh, mean values uh, distributed over a grid of 15 minutes by 15 minutes could be included in the computation of this model. So uh, it's probably that most of these differences are related to the new, to the new gravity data included in this model. Uh, one one model, one global gravity model, can be used for the determination of the IHR Earth coordinates in any region of the world. However, to evaluate the reliability of it, it's necessary to have a, an independent data, and independent data is uh, usually a combination of uh, leveling and uh, to, to say or to estimate how accurate these models uh, are. Uh, one hope regarding the, the use of these global gravity models for the realization of the, of the reference frame, the high reference frame, uh, are the new and better surface gravity data distribution and quality included in the new IGM 2020. And for sure, the release of this new model will, will improve a lot. Uh, the estimates of uh, the gravity field based on global gravity models. This is not only for the potential coordinates of the IHF, but also your modeling, gravity anomalies, and of all, all of these observables you to, to model and to understand the air gravity. Regarding the law, the the solution of the geodetic boundary value problem, which you have, uh, keep in mind 
that uh, the global, global, global gravity models based on satellite gravity data are very precise. So they are surprising one to two centimeters accuracy at spatial resolutions of 100 kilometers. Uh, the minimum mission error of these models, because the attenuation of their, of their gravity signal and the satellite height is about 45 centimeters. So the goal has to be to reduce these 45 centimeters to one centimeter. And, and the most is the solution of the geodetic boundary value problem by combining a satellite only gra uh, global gravity model, surface gravity data, and topographic effects. Uh, the problem here is that depending on the method applied for the computation of the disturbing pot uh, storing potential, um, we can get different potential values. So, one possibility to solve this problem would be a centralized computation of the of the potential value, so like the ITRF in this in this moment uh, to here. Go, got all the contributions of the different techniques, and, and he he is working on a unified and consistent computation of the idea. This would be ideal with the IHRF, but this uh, not easy at all because the gravity data uh, in most of the cases is classified, and it is not possible to get access to banks uh, data banks of the. Uh, another possibility to, to advance in the computation of the high reference frames would be to define, to apply uh, a standard uh, computation procedure. And everyone having the gravity data could be applying this, this standard procedure. However, this is also the, this is neither possible because um, we have different data av availability and quality around the world. And depending on the region where the geoid or the, or the anomalous potential is, is being computed, uh, different characteristics should be taken into account. So there is no chance to unify, to centralize, or to standardize the computation of, of the potential values, and therefore we have to explore this empirically. Uh, for that, we started in, two, uh, in 2017 um, an experiment. It was called the Colorado Experiment uh, because uh, the data we get for the computations are located in Colorado. Okay. And the idea was to compute geoid, quasi-geoid, and geopotential numbers using exactly the same input data, but uh, using different methodologies of colleagues involved in the gravity field. Uh, you can see here uh, we got from NGS, the National Geodetic Service in USA, in USA we got uh, surface gravity data, airborne gravity data, and topographic models, and historical GPS. Uh, and different uh, computing groups uh, decided to use this data and the programs for the computation of these um, different, um, say, characteristics of the gravity field. Um, I would recommend you to keep uh, in mind this publication. There you can find the individual contributions to the Colorado experiment where each group uh, describes in detail how they compute uh, their models. And also there is also a comparison of the individual solutions uh, in this paper. This paper is, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks uh, old. And it uh, uh, summarizes uh, the, the Colorado experiment and the results. Uh, I will not go into the details, but just to show you uh, who was contributing to this experiment, we have 
helping working contributions, one from the Istanbul Technical University, uh, two from Germany and the others from, from other countries in the world. Uh, all of them use different uh, strategies for the computation of, of the um, output, so the OID, quasi-OID as the potential value. Um, I made here a brush classification. Uh, three of the groups were working or determined the quasi-GEOID fields and then made the conversion to the GEOID. And two solutions uh, were computed uh, or were based on the GEOID computation directly. And all of them uh, provide us with, with the potential values according to their modeling. And you can see here the, the comparison. So here the group R, the group A is this one, group B, group C, and D. And you can see here um, the comparison of the different solutions. This black line is showing, is showing the topography of the area. We, we have the, a leveling profile where we can what results. Uh, on, in general, uh, um, all of the 14 solutions agree within, uh, in terms of heights, uh, 1.9 centimeters and millimeters. So they agree with one millimeter in the mean value, and they present standard deviations of about 2.3. There are large discrepancies, you can see here, you can see here, this large discrepancy coincide with the strong topographic uh, the variance in the region. So uh, this let us think that we need to improve the modeling of the topography, topography effects in the deep. In the deep. But uh, it's, it's uh, really interesting to see how 14 different uh, computation groups close, com, clom, come to close uh, results uh, about in the, in the one centimeter, two centimeters. More details about this comparison can be found in this. So uh, this is the comparison between the individual solutions and we make the comparison with respect to the leveling data, GMS data. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is the comparison in terms of the, as a function of the distance. You can see here that most of the solutions at short distances up to 30 kilometers, most of the solutions present an agreement with respect to the GMS leveling data up to three centimeters. This is given in your potential units, so we, we by, by 10 to get uh, so metric units. And here, most of, the, most of the individual solutions are about three, three uh, and an agreement of three, at least respect to GBL. Uh, if we go to the distance, you can see here up to about 100 kilometer distance, we have still two or five these two solutions, these two solutions, we have about three solutions with an agreement of three centimeters. And if we go or that we extend the distance, uh, this agreement is going down. Just to have an idea how the global gravity models are performing in the same comparison, you can see here the results. So this scale here, is exactly the same scale here. And the distances uh, shown here are exactly, exactly the same distances. And you can see here how the models, how the global gravity models are, are performed. So the best one could be this yellow one. And the agreement with the, with the GMS leveling data is about four centimeters. So the best, the best global gravity model presents an agreement which is comparable with the fast or almost the worst um, solution of high resolution. So this, this demonstrates that we need uh, to concentrate efforts on improving the gravity data distribution av and availability for the realization of the high uh, Well, uh, 
when uh, when we finish the Colorado experiment, uh, we try to even identify the key uses to advance in the realization of the high reference system. And we could define three main scenarios for the for the computation of the potential values. The first scenarios, the first scenario covers those regions where no gravity data is exists. Region, we have the satellite only gravity uh, global models, and and this is really a contribution to to the Earth's gravity field knowledge in those regions. But it's clear that if we use only these models for the determination of the of the potential values for the IHRF, we will have accuracies of about 40 centimeters. It's probably to improve this accuracy if we can combine the global gravity models with surface gravity data. Uh, however, to avoid multiple potential values provided by different global gravity models, uh, it would be convenient to recommend a global gravity model as a conventional model for the computation of the potential values in those regions where no data is available. Uh, the second option are, or the second scenario are uh, regions with some surface gravity data, but with poor data coverage, coverage and unknown data quality. In those regions, exists, um, or in those regions, a joint model or quasi joint models are computed, but the accuracy is, uh, is not high enough for the determination of the uh, potential values. And uh, we recommend in these cases um, to perform gravity uh, surveys around the reference station in order to, to have more data for the computation of the potential value at this puntual station, in this specific station, not for the joint computation uh, at national level, but for this reference station. Uh, the fifth scenario comprises those regions with uh, very good, precise, very good and precise uh, joint uh, or quasi joint. Where this data is available is usually also to have colleagues with a huge exper expertise for the computation of, of the anomaly spectrum. Uh, base. Uh, in this categorization, we started the computation of uh, a first uh, solution for the core network of the International High Reference Frame. Uh, the first step is to recover, to recover the potential values from national and regional joint models, and this is again uh, done in the frame of the International Association of Geodesy. Uh, because uh, there, most of the countries uh, have uh, representatives, and we can contact these representatives in the joint modeling uh, to ask uh, for the recovery of those potential values. And we are we are also working with the joint model repository uh, available in the international service for the joints. Uh, the second. Uh, component here is to determine the potential values using uh, global gravity models with uh, topography signals. And then we want to compare the results of one and two to decide which global gravity model can be used in the regions where no uh, joint model is available or where no uh, surface gravity data is available. And then uh, also to evaluate the, re the to evaluate the reliability of the different uh, regional models used. Uh, for that, we are working with many many colleagues around the world. Uh, here are the name of most of them. We had contributions from North America, South America, Europe, Africa, um, Australia, and New Zealand, and on Japan. Uh, and this slide shows, for example, the difference between the potential values provided by the, our colleagues from the Canadian Geo Geodetic Survey and the values provided for the same point uh, by our colleagues from the, the U.S. National Geodetic Survey. They are 
of course, they are, they are using exactly the same input data for the computation of their model, but they are using different uh, methodologies for the computation. So the Canadian uh, compute the GeoEF, uh, the US uh, colleagues uh, compute the quasi GeoEF, and we infer the potential values from the two different models, and you can see that we get a very, very good agreement. Uh, of course, there are some problems in some regions. Here, uh, this is a, a, an island, or here, because this is very uh, remote. But we can say that we have here an agreement at the two centers between the two regions. And the same uh, is seen here for uh, five uh, hidden points located in Germany. Uh, we get the potential values from the European quasi joint model and also the potential values from the German quasi joint model and the difference is very, very, very small. Uh, it's probably the same input data and probably the same methodology. Uh, but uh, this uh, lets us uh, think that uh, the, the results are, are very, uh, let's say, reliable, that the results are reliable. Um, similar comparisons uh, are desired for the other uh, parts of the world. Uh, at this moment, we have potential values computed from the red points you can see here on this map. So all, all these red points have already potential value for the international high reference. Uh, and we are working on the blue and, and the green uh, points. Uh, here, the main challenge is to uh, estimate an accuracy for this potential value. So uh, if we solve the gravity boundary value problem or we, if we use a global gravity model, we get for sure a potential value. The question is how reliable is this potential value? So. More than the potential values, what we need is is a uh, reliable accuracy estimation uh, for this for this solution. Uh, we are working uh, right now on that. And then this is uh, let me go to the concluding the remarks in this presentation. So the realization of the international high reference frame uh, reference frame depends highly depends on the reliability that we the reality with we we can compute the potential value. The gravity the gravity potential is the, the core element in the reality. And and for that we need to estimate this quantity high accuracy and for that we surface gravity data where we want to realize the international uh, from the Colorado experiment, uh, we see that we can reach two centimeters uh, agreement, no one centimeter like we want to, but two centimeters are possible. But this again depends on the availability of the gravity data. So the conditions that we have for the Colorado experiment, where we have more than 60,000 uh, gravity data, have also uh, um, airborne gravity data. And this is not always uh, over the world. So uh, when no gravity data, uh, data is available and we have to use global gravity model and have a uh, very huge uncertainty. Uh, we will uncertainty. The establishment and maintenance of the international high reference frame is only possible in the frame of an strong international collaboration. And this strong international collabor collaboration is possible the International Association of Geodesy. If we would not have the International Association of Geodesy, it would be very, very difficult to try to, to advance in the establishment. Uh, the other thing what we are trying to do now is to install an element within the International Gravity Field Service that takes care of the IHRF. So in the same way, 
that the IRS works on the establishment and maintenance of the ICRF and the ICRF. We need something similar that take care of the of the and I would like to close this presentation with this next picture. Probably you get uh, that uh, one year before, more or less, the Chinese and Nepalese governments announced the new height of the of the Mount Everest. Um, they make two different measurements campaigns. Yes, this is GNSS leveling, so the Nepalese colleagues and the Chinese colleagues. Uh, colleagues uh, do GPS positioning on the top of the Mount uh, Everest, and they could also compute the potential value following the approach I show here. And they they announced to the to the press that, that the new height reference frame, uh, the new the new height of the Mount Everest is based on the international height. I think this is this is a nice example about the necessity. Of, of advance in, in the establishment of this our joint height reference. Um, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sanchez. This is an important task, actually, the establishment of an international height reference frame, like in the uh, horizontal, like like the horizontal uh, frame. Is there if if is, if you have questions, you can write uh, using the uh, questions uh, questions and answers section of this webex. I'm seeing the the the, the section uh, question and answers, but everything. Okay. Right below the screen, you will see the uh, chat. Yeah. Link uh, in in that section, there is a press question and answers part, so you can. See also. Okay, I, I some of them are in Turkish, and unfortunately, I cannot. <laughs> yeah, we, we can we can trans translate the Turkish questions to English. It doesn't matter. I have a question. Uh, we had a presentation in the morning session regarding the chronometric leveling. It's, it's, I I think it's too early to say something about the future of it, but uh, there is an ongoing progress actually in the. Uh, Chronometric leveling using the atomic atomic clocks. Uh, is there a projection of global geodetic observ observing system or international association of Ge geodesy regarding the implementation of the chronometric leveling data into the uh, realization process of the height fr uh, frames? Uh, yeah, probably. So I mean, uh, now the efforts concentrates on the technology. So. Yeah. It's possible uh, with some empirical experiments performed here in Germany, it, it was possible to determine a potential difference with optical clots at the 10, 20 centimeter level. The, the big problem here is that the two clots has to be have to be connected. Yeah. And to get to get the accuracy we want to obtain um, this connection has to be performed with at least uh, fiber, optical fiber, and this is still a, a, a challenge. I mean, as, as soon as the technology is available, we, we can try to implement in the praxis this methodology, but for the moment, it's everything in empirical, in experiment phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah, it is at the experimental stage, actually. Maybe in the future, we will have the outputs of the... In the future, 10, 15, 20 years, I think. But in the... Most the probably. Future. We hope so. And, uh... Uh, I have one question, actually, uh, if it is possible. Uh, well, uh, you have mentioned uh, uh, in your slides uh, the importance of the potential. Uh, there's potential itself. Uh, do you, uh, uh, what do you think about uh, the type of potential, uh, this perturbation of type, this perturbation of tidal potential caused by sun and moon and solar system bodies? Are they reduced properly regularly uh, to get only the uh, uh, potential of the Earth? Uh, I mean, we are using several models, or do, do we need to refine them somehow? I mean, this 
two degrees I, I zero or so. Okay. The, the, the tidal potential, do you mean? That's so the, the, the tidal potential is, is removed from the surface gravity data. So this is a, a useful reduction. And for the satellite gravity data, uh, it is also removed. So um, uh, you, can, you can see in the coefficient C2O. Yeah. 202122, yeah. Yeah, of this of this was removed or no, but but this is this is an unusual unusual reduction, and fortunately we know very well the motion of the sun and the and the moon with respect to the earth. So and with these ephemeris we can determine very well the the the gravity or the attraction potential of these bodies, and this is this is very very well known. Yeah. Yeah. That's, thank you so much for your. Uh, impressive and uh, nice presentation. And thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. I thank you for the invitation. You. It thank was you. very nice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's one question uh, from Aydın Üstün, Professor Aydın Üstün. Uh, he, he asks, according to the current definition of the International Height Reference System, vertical datum is given by uh, WO value, the, ge the geopotential value of the GO8. Is there any attempt to define any, a time-dependent part of WO? Um, I, I, I would try to answer this, this question with a comparison with the ellipsoidal heights. And the ellipsoid. So we can monitor change of the Earth's surface by analyzing changes in the ellipsoidal height. Uh, if our reference ellipsoid would change with time, it would be very difficult to see how the ellipsoidal heights are changing. So we would need to, to know how much how much of these uh, temporal changes correspond to the geoid or correspond to the ellipsoidal heights uh, something similar could be happen with the w0 value therefore we decided to keep the the w0 value fixed to the time uh, in order to have a reference to evaluate changes not only in the physical heights but also in the geoid so the, the, the geopotential value W0 is telling us only which of the infinite number of equipotential surface is selected at the reference surface. The realization, uh, the representation of this ref the, the equipotential surface defined by this W0 value is given by the geoid. So, the realization is uh, so we we represent the geometry of this equipotential surface with respect to the ellipsoid and this representation is time dependent so the geoid can change with time but the geopotential value for the geoid no uh, because uh, if the geopotential value of the geoid would change it would mean that we are selecting another equipotential surface as the reference. And therefore, uh, for convenience and for convention, uh, it was decided to keep this value fixed to the, through the time. Thank you. Uh, he, he continues uh, asking, however, sea level rise should have an effect on this number, he says. Ah, the, the, um, that is a, another point. Um, the, the, the present W0 value was uh, determined using mean sea surface observations from satellite altimetry. Uh, but we decided to, to make this convention and to separate it from the mean sea level. Why? If the, if the reference value W0 value change together with the mean sea level, we, can't, we could not estimate the sea level variation. But why? By the reference surface with respect to we are measuring the mean sea level is moving together with the mean sea level. So in order to determine the mean sea level with uh, the variation of the mean sea level with time, 
the reference has to be fixed if the if the two move together at the same time we we will not have any cbrs because the reference is moving with so thank you it um, was yeah it was i, I think we can we can continue uh, talking those issues, talking about those issues uh, in the Wonder Me session. Just after this session, uh, let me continue the uh, okay. session uh, with the third speaker. The, the next speaker is Mehmet Simav, Dr. Mehmet Simav uh, from General Directorate of Mapping, the national agency in Turkey. He is a senior uh, geometrics engineer in the ge in the geodesic department of the institution. He has been working on vertical coordinate reference systems, regional gravity field modeling, geoid determination, gravimetry, sea level variations, and inertial navigation. Actually, the, uh, there is an ongoing process in Turkey uh, regarding the uh, modernization of Turkish uh, the modernization of the height system of Turkey, and as part of these. Uh, modernization process, a reference frame, uh, vertical co coordinate reference frame uh, is, has been uh, projected actually with, with the uh, leadership of the General Directorate of Mapping. Mehmet Simal will make a presentation regarding the vertical coordinate reference frame of Turkey. Uh, together with the uh, co-authors Ali Sankut, Ayhan Çingöz, İlde Sakpınar, Yunus Aytaç Akdoğan, uh, the, the co-authors of the uh, presentation. Dr. Sima, you, you, Sima, you can uh, start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, dear guests, uh, I will try to explain Turkish vertical reference system and frame, its connection to European vertical reference frame the Turkish joint models, and finally, the height system modernization project uh, recently completed. Uh, our English speaking colleagues, uh, please follow the red words in the slides. Uh, first, I will talk in Turkish, then summarize the current slide in English. Değerli katılımcılar, ben bu sunumda Türkiye Düşey Koordinat Referans Çerçevesi, Avrupa Düşey Koordinat Çerçevesi ile ilişkisi, Türkiye Joint modelleri, Ulusal Yüksek Sistem Modernizasyonu Projesi, e, modernizasyon e, sonrası devam eden çalıştırmalarımız hakkında bilgi vermeye çalışacağım. E, konuşmama koordinat ve fasitlerinin önümüyle başlamak istiyorum. E, Jeodizm'in üç tane temel sacaya var. E, bunlar gravity alanı, e, yer dönmesi ve jeokinematik. Ve bu üç sacayanın e, merkezinde de referans sistemleri. E, yer birbiriyle etkileşimli ve oldukça karmaşık bir sistem. E, bu sistemin işleyişini anlamak, ölçmek ve modellemek için iyi tanımlanmış ve gerçekleşimi yapılmış referans sistemlerine ihtiyaç duyuyor. E, harita üretimi ve coğrafi bilgi sistemlerinin temelinde de koordinat referans sistemleri yapıyor. E, koordinat referans sistemlerini e, bir binanın temeline benzetmek mümkün. E, coğrafiye ilişkin topografya, arazi konumu, yollar, e, enerji nakatları ve benzeri tüm ayrıntılar e, referans sistemleri üzerine inşa edilmekte ve bu e, ayrıntıların da e, haritalar üretilmekte, CBS oluşturulmakta, etüt ve projeler hazırlanmaktadır. E, belirli standartlarda e, tanımlanmamış ve gerçekleşimi yapılmamış e, geçici veya işte lokal koordinat sistemleri kullanımı e, telafisi mümkün olmayan problemleri yol açabilmektedir. E, farklı referans sistemlerinde üretilmiş e, iki haritanın yan yana geldiğinde kenarlaşmaması, e, karşılıklı tünel kazılarının birbiriyle birleşmesi, ee, işte lokal sistemlerde üretilmiş eski kadastro ayaklarındaki aplikasyon problemleri e, hatta günümüzde akıllı sistem, silah sistemlerine girilen hedef koordinatlarının farklı bir referans sisteminde verilmiş olması ve mühimmatın e, dost bilgiler üzerine düşmesi gibi referans sistemlerinin önemini ifade eden örnekleri çoğaltmak mümkündür. Uh, in this slide and the previous slides I mentioned about the importance of the reference system uh, in geodesy, in mapping and GIS in military and in civil engineering. Uh, ISO 19111 coğrafi bilgi koordinatlar ile konumsal referanslama standartına göre uzaydaki bir objeyi benzersiz bir şekilde referanslandırmaya yarayan koordinat referans sisteminin datum ve koordinat sistemi olmak üzere iki bileşen var. Datum 
Kornas dilinin başlangıcını, ölçeğini ve oryantasyonunu tanımlayan parametre veya parametreler şöyle olur. Koordinat sistemi yer ile ilişkiler düzenlemesini sağlıyor. Koordinat sistemi ise söz konusu objeye koordinatları nasıl atanacağını belirten matematiksel kurallar. Dolayısıyla koordinat sistemini kısaca datum vasıtasıyla dünya ile ilişkilendirilmiş koordinat sistemi olarak tanımlayabiliriz. Uh, in this slide, I'll, I talk about the definition of coordinate reference system in accordance with ISO 19111 and its elements, uh, namely the datum and the coordinate system. Bu tanımdan hareketle e, bir düşey koordinat referans sistemi, e, düşey datumdan ve yükseklik ya da derinlik koordinat sistemden oluşmaktadır. E, koordinat referans sisteminin piksel e, yer üstünde piksel noktalar ile gerçekleşimi koordinat referans çerçevesi olarak adlandırılır. E, hali hazırda dünya genelinde birçok ülke lokal veya e, bölgesel düşey e, koordinat referans çerçevesi kullanmaktadır. Uh, in this slide, I describe the vertical uh, coordinate reference system and frame and talk about the local and original uh, frames. I'm sorry. Uh, Türkiye düşey koordinat sistemi e, konvansiyonel bir şekilde tanımlanmıştır. E, ne demek istiyoruz? E, Antalya ortalama deniz seviyesi potansiyeli, jeoit potansiyeli, potansiyeli eş kabul edilmiştir. Yani Antalya ortalama deniz yüzeyi üzerindeki jeopotansiyel sayı değeri sıfırdır. E, ülkemizde gravite ile ilişkili yüksek bir sistemi kullanılmaktadır. E, noktalar arasında potansiyel farkı gravite ve yükseklik farklı ölçüleri ile verilenmektedir. E, metrik yükseklik sistemi olarak da Helmert ortometrik yükseklik sistemini kullanıyoruz. E, noktaların Helmert ortometrik yüksekliğini bulmak istediğimizde öncelikle o noktadaki dengelenmiş yokluktan sayısı hesaplanmakta ve e, Pionkier Frey indirgemesi ile metrik büyüklüğe dönüştürülmektedir. E, ne yazık ki e, düşey datumun tanımlanmasında gelgit sistemi ile ilgili bir tanımlama yapılmamıştır. Uh, the definition of the Turkish vertical reference system uh, is given in this slide. Uh, the vertical datum is an equal potential surface of the Earth's gravity field, which is the mean sea level of Antalya tight gauge. Uh, the coordinate system is gravity-related height system. Uh, the vertical components are the geopotential differences between the benchmarks. And the, for the metric height, uh, metric heights, uh, we use the Helmet orthometric system uh, by Pionkier prior reduction. Ee, bu yansıda da referans sistemini nasıl e, gerçekleştirdiği görülmekte. E, soldaki resim Antalya Mararık Stasyonu'nun sağdaki zaman serisi de 1936-1971 yılları arasındaki e, yıllık Antalya ortalama deniz serisi değerlerini göstermekte. E, bu grafiğin ortalaması e, olan e, 1428 metre değeri Antalya e, bizim datum noktamız olan R36 datum noktasının Yüksekliğine eşit. Uh, in this slide, uh, we show the realization of vertical datum, uh, which is the use of annual uh, sea level data of Antalya tight gauge between 1936 and 1971. Bu yansıda da Türkiye düşey referans çerçevesini temsil eden Türkiye Ulusal Düşey Kontrol Ağı gösterilmekte. Bu ağ yaklaşık 30 bin kilometre uzunluğunda ve 26 bin noktadan oluşuyor. Uh, this is the national leveling network uh, comprised of nearly uh, 26,000 benchmarks. Uh, bu yansıda da Türkiye düşey referans uh, çerçevesinde ilişkin bazı istatistikler, uh, birinci ve ikinci derece nivelman uh, kapanma kriterleri, denge, dengelemenin fonksiyonel ve statistik uh, modelleri gösterilmekte. And this is the summary of vertical reference system and frame of Turkey and some statistics are given in the table. Uh, bu slide'da da uh, Antalya Marok Stasyonu'nun yeri uh, kurulumunda görev alan personel görülmekte. Resimler 1935 yılına ait ve şu anda Antalya Kale İçi Yat Limanı bölgesinden çekilmiş. Uh, uh, These are some historical photographs from Antalya Tight Gauge uh, taken in 1935. Uh, 
bu slide'da da kararları boyunca gerçekleştirilen hassas geometrik travman projelerinden tarihsel görüntüler sunulmakta. And uh, these are the photos from uh, leveling agencies. Uh, uydu konumlama ve, ve navigasyon sistemlerindeki gelişmelere paralel olarak GPS veya GNSS ile ölçülen elipsoid yüksekliklerini fiziksel yüksekliğe yani orta metrik yüksekliğe dönüştürülmek için hepimizin bildiği gibi geoid modellerine ihtiyaç duyulmakta. Uh, I mentioned the necessity of geoid model to obtain physical height from an elipsoid. Uh, ülkemizde 1970'li yılların sonundan uh, sonunda başlayan uh, Türkiye geoidi belirleme çalışmaları 2000'li yılların yıllardan sonra hız kazanmıştır. 1991 yılında gravite sayısal yükseklik modeli ve global geopotansiyel model, model kullanılarak Türkiye için ilk gravite geoid modeli belirlenmiştir. Ardından TG99, TG99A, TG03, TGH09 ve son olarak TG20 modelleri gravimetrik yöntemle hesaplanan Türkiye geoid modeli. Uh, these are the national geoid models completed so far, and uh, the TG stands for Turkish Geoid Model, uh, followed by a year. Uh, bu slide'da da ülkemizde büyük ölçeklerde yapım işlerinde resmi olarak kullanılan Türkiye Geoid modelleri, modellerin hangi yöntemlerle ve hangi verilerle hesaplandığı ve model doğrultuları gösterilmektedir. E, tablonun son satırından da görülebileceği üzere, her yeni model bir önceki modelden daha iyidir. E, son hesaplanan TG23 Joyt modeline ileriki yansılarda tekrar ele alacağız. Uh, these are the officially used Joyt models in Turkey. Uh, how they compute, I mean the least squared collocation, uh, first squared transform, uh, least squared modification of Stokes formula. And the data used in the computations, I mean the global geopotential model, uh, digital elevation model and the gravity. And the last row is the accuracy of the models. Türkiye düşey koordinat referans çerçevesinin Avrupa düşey koordinat referans çerçevesi ile ilişkisine bakacak olursak, Avrupa Birliği adı ülkesi olan Türkiye, Avrupa Parlamentosu ve Konseyi'nin Inspire Direktifini birçok bekarsal veri temasına uyarlamıştır. Türkiye'de ETRS 89 ve EVRS yerine Ulusal Koordinat Referans Standartı kullanıldığından Inspire direktiflerine uyum için e, dönüşüm parametre, parametrelerinin sağlanması gerekmekte. Türkiye ve Avrupa Düşey Referans e, Çerçeveleri arasındaki dönüşüm parametresinin belirlenmesi için Türkiye-Bulgaristan sınırında gerçekleştirilen hassas nivelman ve geometrik e, hassas nivelman ve gravite ölç, bağlantı ölçüleri, ölçüleriyle Avrupa ve Türkiye düşey referans çerçeveleri arasındaki dönüşüm parametresi belirlenmiştir. And uh, Turkey as a candidate country for European Union membership uh, has been adopting inspired directive in many special data teams. Uh, one of the teams is the transformation parameters between the European and the national reference frames. Uh, 2011 yılında Arita Genel Müdürlüğü ve uh, Bulgaristan Askeri Coğrafya Servisi işbirliği ile hem kapı kule hem de tereke sınır kapıları her iki tarafında burada NR10 ve NR7 ile gösterdiğimiz ortak noktalar tesis edilmiş. Bu noktaların hem Türkiye Ulusal Düşey Referans çerçevesinde hem de Avrupa Düşey Referans çerçevesinde yüksekliklere hesaplanmıştır. Her iki çerçevedeki yükseklik farklarında dönüşüm parametresi elde edilmiştir. In close collaboration with Bulgarian Military Journal, Geographic Service in 2011, we performed transborder leveling and gravity measurements at the border at two border gates. The estimated transformation parameter between the European and the Tur Turkish vertical reference frame is, is about 40 centimeter. Uh, dönüşüm parametresi de uygun formatta dokümante edilerek e, bu bağlamda gösterilen e, sayfada e, yayınlanmıştır. Bu sayfayı ziyaret ederek hem düşey hem de türe ETS 89 dönüşüm parametrelerini bulabilirsiniz. The estimated transformation parameter has been published at the information and service system for European coordinate reference system. 
Ülkemizde özellikle 2002 yılı sonrası başlayan genişletilmiş yol çalışmaları nedeniyle Türkiye Ulusal Düşey Kontrol Ağı nokta, e, noktalarının sayısında gün geçtikçe e, tahribat ve azalma meydana geldi. Tahrip olmayan noktalar ise yer dinamikleri nedeniyle yatay ve düşey koronaklarında değişimler oluştur. Uh, owing to the new highways and the road enlargement curves, uh, 70 percent of the leveling benchmarks uh, has been dis distracted, uh, and some of the secure ones have been subjected to position changes due to the geodynamical uh, events. Uh, bunun yanında uh, Türkiye Jeoit modelleme hesaplanmasında ve testinde kullanılan tarihsel gravite ve GPS normal verilerinin çözünürlük ve doğruluğunun arzı edilen düzeyde olmaması nedeniyle Türkiye Yüksek Sistem Modernizasyon Projesi başlattık. Uh, there are some uh, problems in the historical gravity and uh, GPS leveling data, uh, their uh, consistency, accuracy and the spacing. Uh, uh, Türkiye Ulusal Düşey uh, uh, özür dilerim. Uh, Türkiye Yükseklik Sistemi'nin modernizasyonu ve gravit yapısını eleştirilmesi projesi e, Türkiye Cumhuriyeti e, Cumhurbaşkanlığı Strateji ve Bütçe Başkanlığı yani eski adıyla Kalkınma Bakanlığı desteği ve 5 kamu kurumu ve kuruluşun iş birliğiyle 2015 yılında başlatılmış ve 2020 yılında başarıyla tamamlanmıştır. Uh, we started a collaborative project called Turkish High System Modernization and Gravity Recovery Project in 2015 and finished it in 2020. Yaklaşık 38,5 milyon TL bütçeli projede 10 iş paketi oluşturulmuştur. Projemizin amacı Türkiye için yüksek çözünürlük ve doğruluklu bir joint modeli belirlemek ve gravite veri altyapısını iyileştirmektir. Projenin çıktıları Türkiye joint modeli, Türkiye gravite standartı standartizasyon alan uh, hava gravity sistemi, motorizm yanma sistemi, gravity laboratuvarı, gravity veri tabanı ve proje portali ve bazı uh, gravimetrik analiz yazılı. Uh, this is the brief summary of the project description. Uh, the primary objectives of the project are to determine the high resolution and high accuracy joint model for Turkey and improve the gravity data infrastructure. Uh, we have 10 work packages. Uh, these are some of the outputs uh, of the project, uh, namely the Turkish Joint Model, uh, Gravity Standardization Network, Airborne Gravimetry, Motorized Leveling, and some softwares and data portals. Uh, project bütçesinin büyük bir kısmı cihaz tedari uh, ve bunun yanında bağıl, mutlak, hava, GNSS ve nivelmen arazi çalışmaları için kullanılmıştır. 2016-2020 yılları arasında gerçekleştirilen gravite ölçüleri, GNSS ölçüleri ve nivelman ölçüleri ile kalitle kontrolden geçirilmiş tarihsel gravite verileri kullanılarak TG20 Geoid modeli hesaplanmıştır. Hesaplamalarda güncel potansiyel modeller de kullanılmış ve gravimetrik Geoid modelimiz 4 parametre dönüşüm ile mevcut bir şey dostumla uyumlu hale getirilmiştir. Uh, we performed relative absolute uh, airborne gravimetry throughout the country and collect simultaneous GNSS and labeling data. Uh, we co control the quality of the historical gravity database, then compete Turkish joint model and transform it to our vertical data. Uh, TG20 joint model, joint aiming in hızlı değişti. Haritada gösterilen 7 farklı bölgedeki 278 eş zamanlı GPS nivelman noktasında mutlak olarak test edilmiştir. Sonuçlar incelendiğinde Trebolu Torul hat Trebolu Torul bölgesi dışında TG20 Joint modeli doğruluğunun 3 santimetreden daha iyi olduğu, TG03 Joint modeline oranla oldukça gelişmiş bir model olduğunu görmek mümkündür. Bu sonuçlar bir 3 santimetre proje hedeflerimizi eleştirimizi göstermektedir. Uh, the completed Geoid model has been validated and uh, validated in an absolute sense uh, at uh, 278 simultaneously measured uh, GPS and leveling points. 
the results suggest that standard deviations are ranging from uh, one to six centimeters. And uh, these results uh, show that it, it is at least twice more accurate than the previous official joint model. Uh, and the results also show that the recent vision campaigns and the latest global geopotential models bring about a significant and substantial amount of improvement in completing and validating the uh, our joint model. PG uh, joint modelimiz yine aynı hatlardaki e, aralarındaki mesafe 550 km arasında değişen e, yaklaşık 11 bin GPS dinamik nokta çıktı kullanılarak göreli olarak da test edilmiştir. E, bu testte noktalar arasındaki yükseklik farkı için gidiş ölçüleri geometrik dinamandan dönüş ölçüleri ise GPS, GNSS ve TG yerinden alınmıştır. Aralarındaki kapanma farklarının e, birinci ve ikinci ve seri dinamik kriterlerini karşılayıp karşılamadığı kontrol edilmiştir. E, tablolardan ve şekillerden de görülebileceği üzere TG20 geoid modelini %93 gibi yüksek bir oranda ikinci derece, %99 gibi e, büyük oranda ise serinin ama kapanma kriterlerini sağladığı görülmüştür. Uh, the relative test also shows that the, the new joint model outperforms the previous uh, official joint model. Uh, proje sonrasında ise üç temel konuda çalışmalarımız devam etmektedir. Uh, yersel ve hava kremetisi uh, ile sıklaştırma çalışmalarına ara vermeden devam ediyoruz. E, sabahki sunumda sorulmuş herhalde. E, göller bölgesi ve ölçüler bölgeler ve ölçüler ama e, bugüne kadar göller bölgesi ve tuz gölü üzerindeki çalışmaları tamamladık. E, şu an kıyılarda e, Marmara Bölgesi ve Akdeniz kıyılarında uçuşlarımız devam ediyor. E, i̇kinci çalışma konumuz mobil araçlarla daha hızlı gravite ölçmek için e, çalışmalarımız var. E, ayrıca üniversitelerle iş birliklerimiz devam ediyor. Ayrıca daha Hacettepe Üniversitesi ile e, devam eden santimetre altı bölgesel jeoid bölgeleri, kara ve deniz platformları için mobil gravimetri sistemi geliştirilmesi, gravite düşey gradyant alanı modelleme, e, jeoidin GNSS kınarma ile testinde çok GNSS, GNSS ve PPP kullanımı başlıkları altında çalışmalar yürütüyoruz. Hedefimiz ise bir sonraki jeoid modelinde santimetre altı doğruluğa erişmek, Türkçe konuşmamı burada bitiriyorum. Beni sabırladığınız için teşekkür ederim. Son cümleyi İngilizce söyleyeceğim. Uh, after the project is finalized, uh, we continue terrestrial and airborne gravity densification and we are now working on a mobile gravity and cooperating uh, to compute the next joint model with some centimeter uh, accuracy. And I would like to say that uh, we are willing to contribute to the uh, international height reference system and uh, its realization. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, attendees may ask their questions using the questions and answers section. There's one question. There are two questions from uh, Emin Ayhan. First question is, uh, vertical datum is defined based on the uh, TG at Antalya. One, what are the geologic reasons having TG network with about 20? This is the first question. Uh, TG, uh, would you please repeat the question, please? Or, okay. I see. Vertical datum is defined based on uh, one TG at Antalya. The, that could be the Mariograph station, perhaps. Yeah, the vertical the geodetic geodetic having a TG network with about 20. TG network? What is TG network? I don't understand. The network of mariograph stations, I guess. A tight gauge. Okay, tight gauge. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a, a, the, the, the, the vertical it will find only at one, one tight gauge, uh, at Antalya tight gauge, only one. But we know that there are some uh, potential differences between the tight gauges and but uh, introducing the old type gauges uh, to for the definition it may cause some problems. Uh, the second question, true question from uh, Mehmet Emin Ayan is how the vertical datum is modernized, multiple multiple 
uh, TGs, sea uh, level time series analysis at TGs, etc. He says. Uh, we, we, we don't change the vertical data uh, in our new joint model computations. We, we just compute the geometric joint model, then uh, transform it uh, to our current vertical data. No change in the vertical data now. Yeah. Any other question? There is no question. I think there, there was one question from uh, Emin Ayhan uh, yep. for the first uh, speaker. Maybe you can share this with you. Okay. I, I can read from here. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Emin Ayhan is asking to us, okay, he has a comment actually uh, and a question. Uh, in his comment, uh, uh, the first comment of his is a uh, plate boundary region in the south uh, of uh, North Anatolia fault uh, include anomalous velocities. Uh, new clustering may be required. The first yeah, comment I is think this. this question should go to Dr. Alisa Kortay. Yeah, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. But we have forgotten to, to, to we have forgotten to yeah. ask. We are sorry. It is my fault because uh, yeah. uh, I, I could not say. <laughs> And uh, this this was comment only. The second comment was many uh, European reference frames have been defined since 1980s. Similarly, new ITRS solutions shall be required instead of ITRS 96 for uh, Turkish reference frame. Then other uh, and accurate coordinates in ITRS uh, 2014 or later are deformed by converted by transforming to ITRS 96 at the 2005. Uh, who, that is the second comment. And the question is actually uh, how you estimate unknown timing and magnitude of jumps, undocumented change points, it's in parenthesis. Uh, how, how you estimate unknown timing and magnitude of jumps? Bu bu kadar da hocam. Yani aslında hani benim de bu anlamda Zuhair Altamir hocanın dediği gibi yani hani ITLF 96 çözümünden ITLF 2014 çözümüne taşıyabilmek mümkünse bu iyi bir gelişme olacaktır yani. Hani bu benim de şahsi yorumum olabilir. Diğer konuları bilmiyorum tabii. Ee, şöyle e, Kamil Hocam, e, zaten biz tüm çözümlerimizi şeyde yapıyoruz. Hani ITLF 14'te yapıyoruz. Bizim o konuda hiçbir şeyimiz yok. ITLF 20 çıkınca biz... E, e, o uydu yörüngeleri, yer dönme parametreleri bunlar hep e, güncel e, IT sürümünde olduğu için sıkıntı yok. Bizim elimizde e, biz her iki sistemde de tutabiliyoruz şeyleri, koordinatları. ITRF 14, 20 hiç fark etmez. E, i̇şte bu bir şey, e, bu e, bunu e, jeodezi e, şeyini, camiasıyla konuşmamız lazım. E, teşekkür ederim hocam. E, ben, benden biraz önce Metin hocam özellikle hatırlatmamı rica etti. Ee, şeyi birincisi bu oturum sonunda e, soru cevap ve sohbet e, anlamında Wondermi hemen ardından e, Wondermi e, oturumu e, başlatılız başlatılacak e, link ve şifresi aynı dünkü ile e, ve e, 18'de Türkiye Ulusal Jeodesi Komisyonu toplantısı başlayacak e, bu iki duyuru yapmış olayım e, Tevfik hocam söz size kusura bakmayın. <gülüyor> I think it's time to close the session. Uh, thank you very much for your valuable contributions. The contributions uh, increased the scientific level of our meeting. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for the attendees as well for participating in this uh, session too. See you in the Wonder Me session. Uh, we will move to the Wonder Me session now. Uh, if it would be possible for uh, our colleagues, Mifida or uh, uh, Berkay, uh, to again share uh, from a uh, chat uh, the link and the uh, password for the session of Wonder Me. That would be nice. Thank you. Okay. Professor Sanchez, if you like, it is on the chat. Better. Should we close? Okay, see you.
Evet, o pratik oturuma geçmişiz. Çok teşekkürler katkılarınız teşekkür için. Görüşürüz, hoşçakalın hocam. Görüşürüz. Görüşmek üzere hocam. Hocam çok teşekkür ederim. Ağzınıza hocam, sağlık. Biz teşekkür ederiz. Çok teşekkürler, sağ olun. Ben Dink'i yine burada göremiyorum yani. Şimdi Hocam öyle bir problem var. Chat, chat modülünde bir şey var, sıkıntı var. Hocam chat'e kaç kez mesela copy paste yaptım, gönderdim ama bir gitmede problem oldu. Metin Hoca'yla da bu durumu paylaştım ama e, biraz gecikmeli geliyorlar hocam bu şeyler bence. Evet.